Well, Lee, I can tell you at the moment, a big crowd in attendance here, and you can start to feel the uh, the atmosphere starting to rise here. We're getting very excited on pole, as we mentioned. Jason Bright, can you get the run into the first corner and set the pace, do you think? Oh, we certainly hope so. You know, uh, you know, the Pertec Ford's been working really well this weekend, but today's another day. Uh, it's going to be a very long race, and, and I think, you know, everybody on this grid realises how hard it's going to be on that left rear tyre. Jason, best of luck today. Thanks, Greg. There he is, Jason Bright, on pole for today's race. And with Barry on assignment in the UK, another man joining us in pit lane today, and he's all smiles about it too. Hello and welcome to Trent Higgs. Thank you very much, Greg. Now, joining Jason on the front row of the grid is Valvoline Cummings driver Jason Bargwan. And now, Jason, you've brought some impressive form into this meet, including a clean sweep at Winton. How hard will it be to duplicate that kind of speed here? Oh, it's always difficult to try and duplicate that sort of stuff. I mean, obviously, we're looking forward to today. Um, the car's working extremely well. I did a, a long race run yesterday, and... It, it looked after its tyres quite well, so, uh, hey, it's going to be fun out there. I can't wait. What do you think the key is here, survival? Uh, the key, I suppose, do 500 k's faster than anyone else. OK, thanks a lot. Best of luck. Not a problem, thanks. Greg. On the second row of the grid, Mark Scaife, the first of the Mobile Holden Racing Team Commodores. Mark, there's been a lot of talk about this particular race and just how tough it's going to be. How prepared are you? Oh, look, we're, we're very prepared. I mean, uh, the car's gone very well through testing and, um, and practice. Obviously, we're... Up at the pointy end somewhere, we need to stay out of situation. trouble, Greg, and uh, yep. sneak around, don't hurt the tyres, and see where it pops out the end. I mean, Peter Brock used to say, if it's your day, it's your day, and that's the sort of race it'll be. Some people talk about maybe the ego taking over today. You've got to really, I guess, make sure that you really keep that pace to a certain minimum and nurture those tyres. Well, to be honest, we're race drivers and we usually race. Today, uh, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, we'll have to be very restrained, there's no doubt. Good on you, Mark. Best of luck. Thank you. On the next... On the next row of the grid, we've got a man no stranger to such big races like this, former two-time World Touring Car Champion Paul Radisich. Now, Paul, how does this compare to some of the races that you've competed in? Well, it's all about strategy, and uh, a lot of the races have been short distance, but, um, you know, this type of race is all about strategy, and particularly here at Ipswich, is, um, it's all about tyre wear. So good, consistent, but a good, consistent, fast like pace it, is going to win the race. And you're one of the local teams that tests here. How big an advantage do you think that could play? But it always helps. We have done a race, uh, well, one stint distance. Um, so I think we're, we're probably slightly ahead of uh, some of the others here on the grid. OK, best of luck. Uh, thanks a lot. Down on row five, Mark Larkham, a little bit further back than I guess you'd like. But uh, today, these sort of positions don't mean anything in endurance okay. terms, do they? No, I don't really think it'll matter where you start. We're pretty happy to be in the okay. top ten, but uh, I've got to tell you, anxiety has set in. It's, uh, this is really an unknown quantity ahead of us. I think a big part of this race is just going to be conserving tyres. So, uh, and uh, put, we'll try and put some money in the bank for the end of the race. Brad Jones, your, uh, your co-driver here today. How quickly has he settled back into things? Yeah, no problem. We, uh, we just seem to pair up well. We're uh, probably similar characters in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm a bit better looking than he is. Um, and uh, a little bit slimmer in the waist, I've got to say. Uh, no, he's, uh, he's a great, great team player and we love having him on board. Good on you, Larko. Best of luck. Well, as I said earlier, we are just moments away. You see the thumbs up there from one of the Pertec boys to Jason Bright. He sits on pole position. Let's take a look at the Shell Helix grid for the Queensland 500. It is Bright and Baird from pole. Tandra and Barguana. They sit alongside each other again. Scape and Morris from three. Radisich Ellery from four. Lowndes and McConville, the second Mobile One HRT car. Perkins and Ingle from six. Seven is Richards and Murphy. And David and Skippy Parsons from eight. That was an outstanding qualifier. Sure was. Look at the row of Fords here. Larkham and Jones, Longhurst and young Adam Macro joining the Queenslander. John Bow and Jim Richards, very experienced crew there. Seaton and Crompton alongside Dick Johnson and Stephen Johnson. Dick's 200th Shell Series appearance is last in front of a Queensland crowd. Briggs and Lee out of 14. Romano and Mazira had some problems in the warm-up this morning. I believe they're OK. And McDougall and Medecki will start out of 16. Brabham and Bates in the second of the Ford Tickford Racing AUs. That's one of many new driver combinations. Faulkner and newly crowned Formula Holden champ Simon Wills. McLean and Park, Forbes and Full. Coleman and Ritter in the second Valvoline Cummins car. Kelly and Noski, the young Lions are back. Ashby and Reed, and young Queenslander Paul Wheel teaming up with Tassie Tiger, Greg Crick. Capacity field here, Dulman and Cotter in the Gatorade VT. Poole and Scott will team up in the John Deere machine. Row 14, Thorne and Wanless, Osborne and Brett Peters will start out of 
row 14. Wakefield and Canto, young driving combination there, and Dumbrell and White alongside Cranbrook and Croswell. That's a good combination. Trat and Alan Jones making his return to V8 supercar competition. They'll start out at 32. It is a big grid. We have got Rod Nash and Dean Wanless, both the Wanless boys here, Dean and Todd. Heath and Luff, Emma Zedis and Wilmington, Emery and Crick, Trimble Heffernan, Melinda Price returns, the former Castrol Cougar. She is in the Ultra Tune Commodore. Russell and Grant Johnson, Conway and Rick Shaw. And the rear of the grid, Daniel Miller and Tony Ricciardelli, the WA combination, Smurton and Mal Rose, another man making the return to the V8 privateer ranks. They'll start off the back, but in a race like this, Lee Diffie, I don't think that's such a problem at the moment. 161 laps, the journey, and the question begs, will they even get anywhere near 161 laps? The general, well, the general feeling around the paddock and pit lane is that there will be quite a few safety car periods. We have got the in-car cameras for you. This one in the England Perkins car, brought to you by FAI. There's young Steve Johnson sitting in the number 17 Shell Helix Ford, and he'll be teaming up with Dad, but you will see young Steve do the majority of the drives today. Now, that's the Nash Auto Pro Commodore in trouble off the line. Now, they've been having a relatively good run this weekend, so let's hope there's not too many problems and they can get that car going. Yeah, we hear Chris Smurd, and he had a problem. They were trying to do an engine change, apparently. Dramas after the warm-up, but he has not made the grid. So Chris Smurd, great shame for the South Australian driver, will not be taking the start. So it's tough before the race has even begun. Mark Scaife, his in-car, brought to you by Petters. One of many that will bring us all the action from Queensland. It was an eventful sprint round here. Saw Garth Tander take his very first Shell Series win. Who will take out this one today? And more importantly, in view of the whole championship, who will take away the 300 points? It would certainly help this guy, but Mark Larkham and his teammate Brad Jones, not that Brad's counting towards the championship, but uh, Larko is well out of it. He's way back in the high teens. This guy is not out of it. He is in the top 10. It would be a tough ask to win this year's championship. But he is in with a chance. I've just heard from the pits that Chris Merton, he's missing off the grid, but he's actually going to the team last minute frantic preparations. Looks like the car is sitting at pit exit, so we may see the car which qualified last. There it is, the Smurden Rose machine. It was on the last row of the grid. We thought they might have missed it for that engine change, but it looks like he may make the start. Bridgestone race analysis on the screen for you now. The starters of 43, that has gone down by one. Race distance, as we said, 161. Now, the key thing to look at is... Ah, now, Rod Nash, the problem's there. He's out of the car. That's a real shame. The thing we must focus on, there are two things. There is a minimum of two pit stops. They are mandatory. That must happen. And a window between lap 48 and 112 is the window where you must make the compulsory brake change. Greg? Well, Nash is out of the car, Lee, as you can probably see, working frantically under the bonnet. The team tell me the coil lead has come off. He's desperately trying to get it back on so he can get back out on the track. Yeah, well, that's not a, not a hard job to fix. You just got to plug it back on, but you can see that massive air intake system on top of the engine. It's blocking his access to it. It'd be tragedy if he couldn't get that back on. Such a simple repair. That's just the drama that you have in these endurance races. A simple thing like that can cost you a start. Well, you can see Nash's car to the infield there. That would be tragedy. You can hear the revs start to rise. We are just seconds away from the start of the Queensland 500, the very first one on this brand new circuit. Six million dollars invested here just outside of Ipswich at Willowbank. And we are going to see plenty of action this afternoon. As we've said, the key words are conservation and discipline. These guys are going to find it hard to employ some self-discipline because all they are used to is going out and racing hard. We're ready to go. Green flag from the back. You can see the Conway Shaw Falcon in view right back around the last corner. Set to go. The Pertec Ford, the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. Away goes Bright. He gets the jump. Ingle swerves out. He's trying to get a clean run. And it's the dive and it's the run into the first corner. Baguana and Tanda. Tanda behind the wheel, slots into third position. It's Bright who leads the way. They all settle themselves through that first turn. You must get through here cleanly. It is no point making desperate moves. You've got to stay out there for the whole 161. A massive Queensland crowd down at turn one watching the inaugural Queensland 500 as the field sorts itself out in the back straight for the first time. Nice clean start. 
on a 500 kilometre hour enduro. And there's Jason Bright, the man who's been on top of the timesheets all week. They're doing a massive testing around here. And they really, everyone's thinking they have the setup for the race. But who knows? It's such so early in this race. And there's a lot of fascinating scenarios to unfold. There's Rod Nash. He got it going. Excellent stuff. That is tremendous for Rod Nash and Dean Wanless in the Auto Pro Commodore. It's one of the wins cars going through. You will see three wins racing Commodores here this weekend. In the first one, Greg Murphy and Stephen Richards. In the second, John Faulkner and Simon Wills. Already a move being put on John Bowers, Caterpillar Ford. That's the Seton and Crompton FTR AUX R8. Glenn Seton is starting. Real game of tactics here. A lot of people are going to be watching the pace of that Pertec Ford. If they have the demon set up for this race, whatever pace they set, everyone will probably follow. First lap down, standing 119.79. They believe the race pace, talking up and down pit lane, is going to be around 1 minute 12, 12 and a half, 13 maybe. But we'll wait to see how that unfolds. This track condition changing all the time. It's going to be a real battle of wits and a lot of driver discipline out there. So many of the drivers were saying, we've got our strategy, we know what time we have to run per lap. If they bolt, we're going to let them go, no problem. Ellery and Radisic, it is Radisic behind the wheel for this first stint. He makes the inside move on the Valvoline Cummins Commodore, so they drop back to fourth. That's Garth Tander, and they're one of the teams I'm talking about. They said, we know what we have to do, we know the car will stay good, I'm not worrying about the others. Down through this tight twisting section, turn four up to turn five. We're on board. Mark Scaife's car. They're on board with Mark Scaife in the cockpit as he hammers through the gears, shifting back, turn five, points it into pit straight once again. So just a little bit of posturing, a little bit of mind game going on here as these guys just look at each other's position, check each other out. The tactics come into play. It's going to be a fascinating duel. Radisic down the inside. He's starting to book a push on now. Mark Scaife would be happy to let him go. I'm sure these early laps is just a chance to check out who's doing what. A 1.14.2 for our race leader, Jason Bright. He's bringing it down. Let's see if that race pace gets hotter. Well, that's the thing, if it remains there, won't we? Already Radisic, he was the quickest that last lap with a 1.13. He was also quickest this morning in morning warm-up. Paul Radisic is doing a very good job Inside move here, this is Garth Tander. Just ducking up the inside of the number two Mobile One car of Mark Scaife, so they move back up to third now. Russell Ingle hanging around. Down toward turn four once again. Mark Wana hard on the brakes. He just holds that car up in that leading bunch. So it's Bright, Scaife, Radisic, Bargwana, Ingle, Lowndes sitting back in the pack. Longhurst, Stephen Richards in the wins Commodore, Mark Larkham, Glenn Seaton in the first of the factory Fords. Up in 10th position. Bargwana, it's going to be interesting to watch the progress of the Gary Rogers Motorsport team. They test at Winton Motor Raceway down in rural Victoria. This team were absolutely dominant at the Shell Series Sprint Round earlier in the year. And the nature of this track and its track surface very, very similar to the Winton layout. A lot of people are thinking maybe they're going to be strong. Oh, problem here for Spurden. He's having a wretched day. Started from pit lane. Very late engine change before the start of the race. And it's right, those problems, yeah. Well, they, they, they've been experiencing problems all weekend in the IT services Commodore, so they are just continuing. Now, Bargwana yesterday put in about 25 solid laps, all in a similar time zone, and said that they can just keep on pumping that out. So this looks ominous for the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. Bargwana currently sits third behind Radisic and Bright. Two cars up front. This is their home test track, Brighton and Radisic. Scaife back in fourth. Ingle, Lowndes is sixth. Longhurst is seventh. Larkham is eighth. Stephen Richards in the wins Commodore is running ninth. Glenn Seaton in the first of the FTR cars is in tenth position. Paul Radisic in second place. Fastest man in the warm-up this morning. They normally do that on a race setup. And the Shell team, like the Pertec Ford, Spent a lot of time grinding around here in practice. Over 1,200 kilometres of development. Mileage put in here by the team. Well, certainly the Nash Commodore, or rather the uh, Smerton Commodore in the pits. Also Simon Emazidis Falcon is there, Greg. Yes, unfortunately, Lee, the uh, Emazidis Falcon has developed some sort of miss. The team are trying to determine just what's causing it at the moment. And for Smerton, what they seem to think has happened there is that they rushed this engine chain so much that the car may be slightly overheating. It mightn't have enough water in it. Yeah, simple things can go wrong. Drama upon drama at this early stage of the race. There are only four laps in. 
Wright's done another one, a 1.13.49, so time settling down. The last two laps have been in the mid-1.13 second bracket. So it's going to be fascinating to see what pace the leader can run at to make the tyres hang together on this track. Well, not so long ago, we had quite a bit of cloud over the circuit and the track temperature dropped some six degrees. You can see now it is very sunny and it is quite a warm day here at Willowbank. And I would say track temperature is on the way back up. That is not helping the tyre predicament at all. We'll wait and see. They're all nicely, tightly bunched. And you go right through for the top 20 cars are all in the 1 minute 13 bracket. Well, Chris Smerton, we've seen him in trouble, apparently losing oil. <laughs> so hopefully Chris and Mal Rose can get back into this battle. Well, that's looking pretty terminal. You don't want those sort of dramas at any stage during the race, but this early, absolutely heartbreaking stuff. Radisic, looks like he's closing the gap a bit to our race leader. This is an aggressive run by the 36-year-old Kiwi. He's very confident with the race setup of this car. He's going to take it right up to Jason Bright as they break hard at the end of the back straight from 240 kilometres an hour, from sixth gear back to third. And Radisic is getting very, very close to the Fertech Falcon. Well, if you look at uh, the law of averages for the 36-year-old Kiwi, he is due for a great race. Of course, we saw him start on pole at Simmons Plains in Tasmania early in the year. A little bit of smoke there from Bright's car. Just a bit of, Might bit be of a brake lock-up. Yeah. And that's something you can't afford to do here. With only 16 tyres to go the distance, <laughs> you have to treat everyone like a piece of crystal glass. It's so valuable. Keep in mind, if these teams have to dip into a 17th tyre, a 60-second penalty is added to their race time. So it's very, very important that you make these 16 tyres go the distance. Keeping in mind, too, a one-minute penalty, and a lap around here is just a little over a, a minute. Let's do a lap with the enforcer Russell Ingle in the Castrol Commodore. This is Queensland Raceway. Pertec forward, but you've got Bright, Radisic, Bargwan, Escape, Ingle. Lowndes coming into the battle too, but the fastest man on the track last time around was Mark Larkham back there in sixth position. A 1.12.7. He's the first guy to drop into the 1 minute 12 second bracket. Keep in mind, the lap record here is a 1.11.00 set by Garth Tander during his winning performance during the Sprint Series round here early in the year. So still a long way from lap record pace. Lowndes moves up into sixth position behind Ingle. Now Larkham back to seventh. Seaton Richards, Stephen Johnson up into the 10 now. Dougal McDougal, who's sharing the drive with Andrew Medici this weekend. Mao is in 12th. Longhurst is 13th. The Parsons combo. That is Truckee, who's starting the race. He's in 14th at present. John Briggs, team with young Tim Lay, round out the top 15. Well, this is getting like one of those NASCAR races you see on those high-speed ovals in the States. The leader's just sitting in the lead draft, yeah. the lead pack. And just got to stay on that lead lap, see who wilts first. We said at the top of the show, this is the ultimate tactical battle. Each team has a different strategy. When Mobile Holden racing team driver Mark Scaife came into contact here, first it was Brighton Barguana dicing. This is Barguana. Oof. And then Bright contacting with Scaife and major problems looming for him. Mark Scaife did come into the pits and has since gone one lap down. Here's another angle and the contact there between Oof. the Mobile One car and the Pertec car sent Scaife spinning onto the infield at a very early stage in this 500 kilometre battle. And Scaife, as we said, has gone one lap down. This is our new race leader, Jason Barguana in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. He leads the way on lap 12. Yeah, boy, it all happened in the break. Snuck past Paul Radisic. Look at that, Russell Engel on the charge too. Now, 
Granisic back to third position. Bright still up there in fourth. But I don't know what happened there. Misunderstanding between Mark Scaife and Jason Bright. Bright was slow coming out of turn four. Scaife clipped him. Scaife's in Scaife's back into the pits. Now look at the damage on the front guard there. Greg Rust is on the spot. Well, Mark, the car came in during the course of uh, the ad break after that unfortunate crash. Now the car has sustained a lot of damage to the front right. They tried to fix it before he went out before. The boys are looking at lower ball joints, control arms. It looks like they're telling Scaife to, uh, to give them a description of exactly how the car feels. The car was almost crabbing at the front when it came down pit lane. They've already thrown on four fresh tyres, but at the moment the concern is this, uh, this handling of the car. Mark, I don't know if you can see him, but he is very disappointed right now. Yeah, you would be too. I guess already, look at him shaking his head. Big plans for the Queensland 500. Challenging for the lead of the Shell Championship Series with his teammate Craig Lowndes. And look at that head hung low. The picture speaks a thousand words. Well, the thing is, is that if Craig Lowndes goes on and takes the double points, the 300, as we have a look at the Shell Helix replay, Oof. bang, that right front. I don't know what happened there, whether, whether uh, Jason Bright missed a gear or something. He was very slow coming out of turn four. Scaife, well, I was going to say he's lucky he didn't clout that Marshall's post there, but look at the damage to the car. Lower ball joint, the boys are saying. Part of the suspension damage. And that is very, very time-consuming stuff. He's already many laps down on the leader, Jason Bagwana. So it just goes to show you can have the best preparation, the best team built around you. A little incident like that can take you out of a major race, a major championship. Well, that's the thing we we're talking about, is that uh, if Lowndes goes on and takes the double points, the 300, and Scaife, well, as we see, Mark is already in a lot of trouble. Here's another passing maneuver. This is Seaton on Larkham. The two Ford runners, that will be just disastrous for Mark in terms of the 99 Shell Championship Series. Let's hope he can get back out there. The race still very, very young, but valuable time lost. Seaton now moves up into fifth position in car five. So it's Barguana, Ingle, Radisic and Bright. Seaton's making a good move. They've been struggling with grip all weekend. They haven't found the setup they like in terms of performance, but the positive factor is that the tyres aren't graining up. They're avoiding that problem. And in a long distance race like this, OK, maybe the car doesn't have as much grip, maybe it's not as fast as the hot shots in qualifying, but if that car's not graining up its tyres, that's what you need for 500 kilometres around this place. Well, for about the last three laps in a row, Jason Barguana has gone 1 minute 13.1. 1 minute 13.1. Lap after lap. He is very consistent at the moment. So too is Ingle sitting there. We go back down and have a look at pictures from the pits. This is the number two Mobile One Holden Racing Team Commodore of Mark Scape, and the guys are working frantically. As you can see, yeah. the damage to the front right. We're going to pull that uh, whole brake disc and caliper assembly off. Looks like they're going for a new lower suspension arm. That was a hard hit. It's bent the suspension. There's Paul Morris. And it looks like a uh, very disappointed Paul Morris is with our Greg Rust. Well, Paul, at the moment, this is not where the, uh, the Mobile Holden Racing Team wanted this particular car. Just tell us exactly what Mark's had to say to you. I haven't spoke to him, but I saw the replay, and um, Barguana passed Brighty, and Brighty was at a very slow entry speed, and Mark was committed to the corner and just tagged him on the, uh, on the left uh, rear, and it's uh, bent the lower arm on the car. The obvious question, the boys are working frantically here at the moment. Can they repair it and get it back out there? Well, they'll compare it, repair it all right, but we'll be nowhere in the race. But uh, we'll just have to see what we want to do from here, really. You had high hopes, I know. Hard luck, mate. Thanks, mate. Mark Scaife has already gone four laps down, and it just keeps getting worse. Make it one more. It's five laps down as of now. The leaders have crossed the uh, start-finish line. As we go on, it is still Barguana, and yet another 113-1. He is so consistent at present. Ingle, Radisic and Bright. Congratulations to Barry Bright of Oak Park, Victoria, our 10th Ford competition winner. He wins the Ford Tickford Racing Pack. And certainly having a lot more luck today than Mark Scaife and Paul Morris. Oh, well, looking out the back of the bite of 10 Ford, there's the car that carries the hopes of the Mobile Holden Racing Team in the Queensland 500. And indeed, the Shell Championship Series, a critical round this, twice as important because it's got double the points. Craig Lowndes and Cameron McConville carrying the weight now of the Holden Factory team. Top place privateer at the moment is Rodney Forbes, and not too far behind is Greenfield Mowers Ford driver and Cameron McLean this weekend teaming up with fellow Queenslander Wayne Park. Joseph Barguana. 
another one controlling the pace, it seems, from the front. Fastest man on the track the previous lap at 1.13.6. He drops it back half a, half a second. A 1.14 neat for Bargwana Ingle, a 1.14.04. There's some quick guys around there. They're all hovering around the mid-13, high-13, low-14. By the time they thought the pace was going to be about a mid-12, it just shows how difficult it is under a race condition compared to testing around here. Yeah, they're all dropping it back, aren't they? I'll tell you, someone who is going well is the second Ford Tickford Racing AU of Jeff Brabham. The 1993 Le Mans 24-hour winner, a move going on here. This is Murphy on the inside. Nice move, so he slips up there. Just double checking our timing monitor here and it is Stevie Richards in the car. Yes it is. We're just uh, just trying to get a sneak peek of the helmet there. So the wins racing team, that is the highest place of their three cars here this weekend. John Faulkner is further back and John is suffering from a uh, quite a bad back this weekend. Looks like Richards slowly closing in. A nice move on Lowndes to move up the order. Lowndes obviously driving quite a disciplined race. And he slipped back a couple of positions. It's Jeff Brabham in the second of the FTR Fords has passed Lowndes that time around. He drops back to ninth. Stephen Johnson playing the opening stint at Shell 17. He's up to 10th. It's Dougal McDougal, John Bauer and the Caterpillar Ford sitting back there in the top 12. David Parsons, Tony Longhurst, Cameron McLean. The first of the privateers up there in 15th position. Stevie Richards slipping up the inside, so he's got another position. So Richards moves up one higher again. He's now in the sixth position. Larkham not too perturbed, and we've seen most overtaking manoeuvres like that. have given them plenty of racing room. And we're slipping back down into the 13s. Bargwana with a 1.13.8. It's all fairly mixed up. Cameron McLean back in 15th position. He has moved Rodney Forbes back to 16th. McLean is now top privateer at present, just in behind Tony Longhurst. An outstanding effort by the Siemens Mobiles team of Paul Romano and Thomas Mazira to get that car here. And we see Brabham. slipping up the inside, Jeff Brabham. He's on a real forward surge. He really is. You've been watching him climbing up through the times there. Just behind. Behind. He qualified 17th, <laughs> and he's now up into 7th. Yeah. Well, they've been working very, very hard. I think Glenn Seaton was frustrated with the progress they were making on the cars throughout the week. Didn't have the outright speed. But they're looking stronger and stronger as this race wears on. Dougal McDougal on the inside of Stephen Johnson. Let's him through in the X. Larry Perkins built Wayne Gardner Commodore. So Dougal McDougal doing a good job in the opening laps. John Bow too. Lap 18 completed. Bargwana, the leader, still 113.8. 114 for Ingle. So times hovering around the high 13, low 14 mark. There's Cameron McLean, the first of the privateers. Absolutely brilliant, dominant job in the V8 Privateers Drivers' Championship this year. That move, carrying that form up right up to this race. And moves for 14th. He's now battling with Stephen Johnson for 13th. So McLean on a forward move also. It's pretty tight Whoa. there. Rodney Forbes. McLean's drifted wide. He's lost one, maybe two. Yeah. He's going to have to be careful not to contact there. Good driving by Rodney Forbes. He used all of the ripple strip to give McLean some room as well. So the position he took away from Tony Longhurst, he just gave back. It'll be uh, very interesting to see how young Adam Macro goes, Formula Ford champ of two years ago. He's teamed up with Tony this year in the Castro AU XR8. Tony has given him a lot of responsibility, but has big wraps on the young guy. Down through turn one, Longhurst on the attack. Stephen Johnson just obviously driving to a controlled pace. We hope there's no problem with the car, but he's letting cars through all the way around. Maybe they have a very strictly determined race plan. We will find out after 500 kilometres around here. Rodney Forbes, the Sydney Privateer. The man who took the fight up to Cameron McLean in the Privateers Championship this year. They're running nose to tail. They go on board with Stephen Johnson. There's Forbes up the inside in the ex-Wayne Gardner Racing Commodore. So the Privateers on the charge in the opening laps of the Queensland 500. Is a Shell Helix replay. This is Dougal McDougal in the Yellow Quench VT giving the cat forward of John Bow a little bit of a nudge. Ooh. How are you going? And he slips through on the inside. Yeah, that moved him up to 10th position. Bow was sitting in the top 10. 
he drops back a slot. Mark Skate has rejoined the race. He's 12 laps down. His championship rival and teammate Craig Lowndes is in ninth place, 22 points ahead of Scape in the championship. Keep an eye on Scape. Can he get any points out of this race? Can Lowndes win it and seal the whole thing? But here's Osborne's incident. The Shell Helix replay. The Queenslander parking it in the gravel. Now, the most important thing to come out of all of this is that the bright Pertec Ford was the first to come in. It was the one to make advantage and make the most of that safety car. First up, after 24 laps, Bright in. Yeah, well, Bright. And making the most of it. He's going to the back of the queue. He was just coming out of the pits when the safety car was coming past the pit exit. And under the rules, they have to hold the car in pit lane until the whole field's gone through. So he goes on to the back of the queue. But. That's one compulsory pit stop up on everyone else. So Ross and Jim Stone choosing to call Bright in early. It was interesting watching Jason Bright in those opening laps. He set the pace for the first few. And then after that collision with Scaife, he just sat back in that leading four. Doing the same sort of times as the race leader. But he was running, obviously, a little bit more conservatively. Maybe it's a chance for them to check out the form and the tyre condition of the other teams around them make sure they really are on the ball with their race plan. There he is, right at the back of the queue when the cars go back to green racing conditions. Holden fans and Mobile One fans, your man Mark Scape has gone down some 13 laps from that collision with Jason Bright. And is Back on track, that's the good news. There he is, but a very disappointed Mark Scaife. But you can bet one thing, he will be a very determined Mark Scaife as the Colour Scan Falcon is assisted out of the sand trap. The Osborne Peters combination back on the road. It's interesting, Bright making that early stop, isn't it? Remember uh, the opening laps of the FAI 1000 at Bathurst last mm. year? Ross and Jim Stone chose to bring that car in very early. And you get that leapfrog situation where, sure, you go back in the pack, and then everyone else has to make their regulation stops, and all of a sudden, you move right up to the front of the grid, and you've also one step up on everyone else. So, not a bad tactic. Most teams look at the safety car period as an opportunity to come in and do tyre changes and brake pad changes, driver changes, whatever, under safety car period, because the race pace has come right down to a snail's crawl, and that's the best time to do it, because you lose the least amount of time. Under safety car conditions in endurance races, the rules change from the Shell Championship Series sprint rounds, whereby in the sprint rounds under safety car, the first five laps don't count. In endurance races, they do. So the lap board keeps on ticking over. As we see the field, it's been reasonably sedate so far. They've been a little cagey. We've seen a big forward move by Jeff Brabham in the second for Tickford Racing AU. He has come from 17th up into 5th. It's been the, he's been the biggest mover so far, and Barguana has been very consistent. Lights are off on the safety car as he comes through the final turn onto pit straight. We should be just about ready to go under green. Yes, we do. We're back under racing conditions. Barguana, he gets the early jump on Russell Ingle. That's car in between is the Conway Ford. Gosh. We are back under race conditions. There's a huge gap there, isn't it? Another Tim Schenk and Clark, of course, in the driver's briefing, telling everyone to bunch right up before that safety car peels off. Well, there was a massive gap there, 100 metres or more, which is a big disadvantage for the field. Bargwana really gets the hammer down. There it is there. Look at the gap there. Yeah. Second to third. Ingle goes with him. Radisic in third and the two. Factory forwards, the FTR Falcons, Glenn Seaton and Jeff Brabham. And that's a great sight, heartening sight for the Ford fans in the opening laps of the Queensland 500. Dougal McDougal up the inside of Craig Lowndes. They're battling for eighth position. A bit further back in the pack, Chucky Parsons. Now, this is what we saw before. When the uh, cars are going back to racing conditions. Lowndes quite happy to let people through. He's been just hovering around the back of the top ten. Now, whether that's a very disciplined race plan he's driving to or whether he's struggling with maybe a lack of tyre grip, we'll find out as this race unfolds. And he is carrying the weight of the Mobile Holden Racing Team 
at Queensland this afternoon. And he has dropped now out of the top 10. McDougall and David Parsons, that's Truggy Parsons, have gone ahead now. An FTR car came into the pits there. We'll see what number that is. That's that is a Seaton. Yep, so Seaton is in early also. But 27 laps completed. Well, it's going to be fascinating to see what these other teams do. If you were going to run a two-stop strategy, you had to at least get about 53, 54 laps out of your tyres for the first stop. Well, they're nowhere near that. Well, that's what the general consensus was. If this was going to be one on a two-stopper, it would be an exceptional effort, Greg. Well, Lee Glenn Seaton choosing to remain behind the wheel at the moment. Four tyres going on. They're going to top up 120 litres of fuel. The only thing that's running through my mind is why he didn't come in during the course of that safety car period. The question is, did he perhaps read the situation wrong? Only time will tell. Tactics are really going to win this motor race. Reliability, speed, controlled aggression, and tactics, tactics, tactics. Who's got it right? Oh, hang on, we've got a problem here. Bonnet going up on the number five car. That's not a good sign when you're only 27 laps into a 161 lap contest. Feverish work going on. We can see Neil Crompton bending over there talking to Glenn. Now Lowndes has gone past Mark Larkham. He is back up into the top 10. So it's Barguana, Ingle, Radisic, Brabham, Richards, Larkham 6th, McDougall 7th, Parsons 8th, Lowndes 9th, Bowers in 10th as the Conway Ford drops a wheel off the circuit. It's very, very congested oh. in that top 10. Outside, just outside of the top 10 is Tony Longhurst, the third car in frame there. Well, this was the concern of the leading drivers. Another point raised in the driver's briefing. A number of drivers here are V8 rookies. Not a very experienced at racing in this competition on such a tight little track like this. But dramas for Glenn Seaton in pit lane, Greg Rust. It certainly was, Mark. He's just leaving pit lane now. A lot of time lost in pit lane here. What has happened? It looks as though it's some sort of electrical problem. The boys working on both the leads and one of the spark plugs. Well, as Seaton exits the pit lane, we see an inside move on Larkham. Courtesy of Tony Longhurst and Cameron McLean is lining up for his go also. So it's fairly frantic around that top 10 mark between Larkham, Bow, Longhurst, McLean and Rodney Forbes has stuck right with his privateer arch rival Cameron McLean just outside that top 10. 15th and is a very good effort at the moment. Paul Wheel in the KNJ Radiators Falcon teaming up for this race with Greg Crick. Jason Bright, meanwhile, after taking the opportunity to make that stop, he's back in 28th position. A 1.15.7. His first flying lap back under green flag conditions. He's got a new set of tyres on the car. He's going to be very conscious of not working those too hard as he weaves through the traffic. It's just so critical here. The more you weave and darken, lean on the tyres, the harder it is on the rubber. And this is the battle for the lead. Jason Barguana. Forced his way through to lead in the opening laps. And Russell Engel in the Castrol Commodore. Well, you can never take your eyes off Larry Perkins and Russell Engel, can you? Russ, Larry's had a shocking sprint series so far. But whenever it comes to the Enduros, the eyes come on. Well, the gap now closing between the two leading Commodores. Here is the Enforcer. He is super fit at the moment. He's been working very hard and looking forward to the Enduros. Now, let's not forget, he is a championship contender at the moment. Russell Engel sits third on 1,288 points, not that far behind Craig Lowndes, the series leader. Now, it's getting tied up front here. The leading car, the number 34 car, as indicated, this is the Tander car. This is the newest of the two Valvoline Cummins Commodores. This is the one that was debuted only a number of rounds ago for Garth Tander. Ritter and Coleman, the two new boys to the Valvoline team. Gary Rogers has put them in Barguana's number 35 car. The enormously experienced Jeff Brabham. Right behind Paul Radisic. Two very experienced drivers. Battling it out for third position in the Queensland 500. Jeff Brabham, without doubt, one of our most decorated international Aussie race drivers, former Le Mans winner, of course, with Peugeot back in 1993, former Sandown 500 winner, three times winner of the IMSA GTP series in the United States. He's had experience at IndyCar racing. He's an enormously talented and experienced driver, and he's putting all that to good news here. He's in fourth position, and it just shows 
in qualifying. You just can't take your eyes off anyone in that field. He's, they've just been right down the back of the top 20 all throughout the week. And now when it counts, they're in the top five. Well, let's not forget that Jeff started almost 100 IndyCar races. He finished second six times. He has got a truckload of experience. And this just goes to show how professional and how talented he is. He hasn't driven a V8 supercar yeah. besides a, a very small Whoa. amount of testing. Rodney Forbes has gone. Wow. The PPG Commodore Forbes has gone in a cloud of dust but comes back on. That looks like it was down at turn three. Oh. Yep. Forbes well. back on. Could this be the privateers starting to run into tyre dramas before the level one teams? Well, they were pushing quite hard. Forbes was staying with McLean. Who knows? That's uh, it's a little difficult to judge from here. Here's the Shell Helix replay. Well, time will tell as this race wears on. 31 laps down of 161. We've seen a few privateers spinning off into the dust and the gravel traps around this circuit. Could this be an indication of things to come? After 35 laps, Seaton, Bright and Scaife are way down the track. Bright in the best position. He's up to 24th now. But how much drama is unfolding here? There is another championship contender, but he's in a great spot. Russell Engel, second to Jason Barguana. Big dust patch there. The minor 10 lap counter, 36 of 161. Someone has gone off there. As these guys they appear to be slowing just a touch. And here is why. It is the John Trimble entry running right off. Now that looks like he's run, just run out of brakes. Trimble's car. There you go. Oh, ah. Front end. Is it got a flat tyre? Flat tyre, yeah. Mm, might be. That would make sense. So John Trimble straight on. Down at turn one. So Stuck he's stranded there. right out in the Sahara there. Massive area there to arrest cars that are out of control. 230 kilometres an hour on the approach to that corner. It's nice to know you've got that safety blanket out there, but he's gone way, way out. Here comes John Bauer in the Caterpillar Ford. 36 laps completed. Jimmy Richards is getting ready too. There we go. Watch Jimmy, the driver change. They were very slick. Trent Higgs. Yes, at the moment we've got John Bauer jumping out of the car and Jim Richards getting back into it. It looks like the cat team are taking no chances with tyres. They've put a new set of tyres on. They're also topping up the fuel. So it looks like a pretty slick stop here. Well, that's what you can expect from the CAT team, especially two very experienced campaigners. I was talking with Deb, John Bow's partner, and uh, she said that Jimmy has had a very calming influence on the team, Greg. Everything going very smoothly down here at the moment for Mark Larkham and Brad Jones. Brad is already behind the wheel. Larko is out of the car. The tyres look to be in fairly good condition, I must say, guys. The tyres that came off Jason Bright's car looked a little more shabby than this one, so we're going to have to keep a close eye on how the tyres are going. Now, this has gone a little longer than they've expected. Problems for the front left, 37 seconds for the Mitre 10 team at the moment. This is not the slick sort of stop they were looking for at this point in the race. That is much longer than they've practised, much longer than expected. Now, Brad Jones, is, uh, there's problems for Brad there. Now he gets going. There was a little bit of a hiccup, and he was indicating behind his helmet there, but he's back out. He tucks in behind the Anthony Tratt, Alan Jones, Toll Falcon, and they get going again. Back out on the circuit, a driver change. It was a bit of flurry there. This is the second safety car we have seen so far, and as predicted, I think we will see many today. The Allo Quench VT Commodore going through there. What an outstanding effort by Dougal McDougal. It really is an extraordinary effort by Dougal, car prepared by Larry Perkins Racing. Has indeed the David and Skippy Parsons machine, even though they've bought the car. Part of the deal is prepared by Fred Gibson. So you hope the rope's long enough. Yeah. <laughs> They're running <laughs> they out of rope. Look. They go a long way. <laughs> That's how far off the road uh, Trimble went. So they're going to have to get a longer bit of rope or stick the four-wheel drive into the sand. But it's going to be quite a while before they pull Trimble out of that mess. Get down there, Marco. Your arms will be long enough to stretch that. <laughs> yeah, it's been very frantic. We've seen some driver changes. Currently, it is Bargwana who leads the way. Look, there is the Pertec Ford. This is the John Trimble. Chef's on the run entry, trying to limp back yeah. to the pits. We've seen a flat uh, tyre, a little bit of damage to the front left. He's doing his best to try and limp back. Well, it's very critical that he does limp back, Lee, because uh, under these race regulations, the car has to get back under its own power, get that, that drive back to the pits under its own power, not to be disqualified. So it's very important for Trimble to try and limp it back on that flat tyre. 
And that's what we're waiting for under this safety car situation. Trent Hicks. I'm down the Winds Racing Pit where the, te the team of John Faulkner and Simon Wills have made an unscheduled stop. John has back problems. John, can you tell us some more? Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's pretty hard getting out of a good race car, but it's just excruciating. Every time I brake, the pain just shears up my back. And when that happened in Adelaide in the endurance race, I nearly crashed the car, so I thought it's better to come in now while there's a few safety cars and put Simon in the car, because I'm sure I'll do a better job at the moment. But I've got a Cairo waiting here, so maybe I'll get some help. So what's the plan? You go and get some work done on it and then get back out there, hopefully? Oh, yeah, look, I feel really good. It's just that when I brake, it just a scre you know, screaming pain goes into my, into my back, so I, I'm just not good for the car at the moment. It's not fair on a team to stay. You know. Okay, well, commiserations. I hope it gets better. Thank you. He's not the only one in the John Deere VT. Commodore Mark Poole has had right. to jump out of the car and put Tony Scott in because exactly the same problem. He's got a nerve problem, putting a lot of pressure on his back, and when he presses the brake or the accelerator, whenever he's got to extend, it's really putting him in a lot of pain. The doctor is with him right now, so that's two guys out with some back problems. Greg? Well, the game of strategy, Lee, is uh, happening down here in pit lane at the moment. I'm with uh, Campbell Little, the chief engineer for the Stones Brothers Pertec Racing Team. Now, Campbell, you brought in Jason a little earlier than what most would have thought. Uh, tell us your, your ploy there. Uh, well, we didn't really have a ploy. Um, there was a bit of an overtaking, ambitious overtaking move early in the race. Took a smack in that left rear wheel. The tyre we're concerned about all weekend, and uh, he's complaining the car was handling a little off, so we thought we'd better come in while we had the chance and have a look at it. Um, he's, he's much happier with the car now. But, uh, you know, obviously we, we paid the price for it. Um, what can we do? We're, we're still on, on sort of schedule for where we wanted to be. Uh, a lot of cars didn't stop in, in that pit stop, uh, in that pace car as well. So I think we'll be right. We'll be there. Very quickly, I noticed that you and Jim were a little concerned about the shape of the tyres that came off the car. Are they OK? Yep. The, um, looking at some of the other cars around too, the, the left rear is getting punished as everyone knew it would. And, uh, we think we have altered the rear wheel alignment a little bit with that punch, so... We'll check in with you later. Back to racing conditions in the Queensland 500. Full green flag as the field launched back into racing. This great battle between Jason Bargwana and Russell Ingle. It's been going on for many laps now. Lap 40 of 161. Jason Bargwana and Russell Ingle locked in this tremendous tussle. Paul Radisic, 1.2 seconds behind. Ingle looks like he really wants to take the lead of this thing the inside of Bargwana as they reach top speed, maximum speed on the Queensland track. Has a look up the inside, he goes deeper under brakes than Bargwana and Ingle takes over the lead. Well, smart driving there by Jason Bargwana and good driving by Russell Ingle, but Bargwana doesn't need to get tangled up in a duel with Russell Ingle at the moment. If the enforcer wants to take the pace out, let him go. If Russell feels they've got the perfect setup, they can conserve their tyres and they've got their strategy worked out, well, so be it. If you want to make it all the way to the end, you can't afford to get caught up with too many battles at the moment, pushing too hard. There is the number one Mobile One Holden Racing Team Commodore, Craig Lowndes, not too far down the track. We will see him hand over to Cameron McConville, and he is right on reigning Bathurst champ Stephen Richards. I'll tell you what's interesting too is the two cars that are fighting it out for the lead of this race. Both have Winton Motor Raceway down in Victoria as their nominated test track. A lot of people have said this track and Winton have a lot of similarities in terms of track surface, layout and the demands on setup. They're the two cars that are dominating the race at the moment. But we've got a long, long way to go. Paul Radisic, Jeff Brabham back there in third and fourth positions. So a tremendous tussle. Craig Lowndes trying to find his way through the traffic. He's in sixth position. Looking up the inside of Stephen Richards in the wind's Commodore. Lowndes goes deeper under brakes, takes him. So Lowndes now starting to pick up the play, pick up the pace and apply a bit more pressure in the Mobile One Commodore. And Dougal McDougal, outstanding drive. Well, another very good drive too. Back in 12th position is the KNJ Radiators car of Paul Wheel. Team with Greg Crick he will be just out of shot there. He's in 12th position, the young Queenslander, so doing a good job. This is tight here, though. McDougal in the Yellow Quench VT. He's under siege at the moment by Tony Longhurst. The guys who haven't pitted are getting a good run out of their tyres. 42 laps of 161. McDougal gives Longhurst plenty of racing room. It's going to be interesting to see which of these teams is going to try and drag it onto that two-stop strategy. They're going to need about 53, 54 laps. Just getting out of the car. <laughs> A very hot John Bow. John, we're just talking about team strategy. Uh, what can we expect here? Like, how, how are the tyres on your car after that first stint? Mark, uh, 
all week we've uh, had graining tyres and would you believe then I had a blistered one. So uh, it's something I certainly haven't experienced before so uh, really a, a loss to explain it but it's, uh, it seemed like an opportune time to, to change it. We've, uh, we've spoken so much, John, about that uh, the key words are conservation and, and uh, the drivers, you guys have got to employ a fair bit of self-discipline. Is that hard to do out there at the moment? Do you just want to get stuck into it? Well, you, you just have to drive it like with your fingertips, like you're on eggshells almost, and uh, even then I've missed a tyre. So uh, I think, you know, more experience on this track would be a help, but uh, the, uh, the Commodores seem to look after their tyres a bit better at the moment. You had a very good run here in the uh, in the sprint round uh, here at Queensland Raceway in the very first run. Is the track has the track improved any as such with more rubber being laid down? Have you experienced that? Uh, no, definitely not. It's uh, if anything, it's probably become worse. It's uh, it's just an unusual surface, and uh, I, I think it's probably technology. You know, they've improved the, the compound of the asphalt, and uh, consequently, it, it uh, creates dramas with the tyres. Quite a warm day here in Queensland. We're just over the hour mark in terms of race duration. How are you finding it in the cockpit? Well, when you're driving that gently, it's very easy. You can drive around all day, but the problem is, you know, once the tyre starts to give some trouble, well, then you, uh, you know, you can't actually use the car at all. So it's just one of those things you, um, you have to wait and see what happens at the end of the day. Paul Radisic making an inside move there, so he moves up on the inside of Barguana. And Bargwana has now dropped back into third, and Lowndes is right on him as well. So Russell Ingle leads the way from Radisic. Will we see Bargwana pit this time round? Lap 44 of 161. Well, Ingle's really picked up the pace, hasn't he? We saw them stop hovering around the 113.5, 113.9 area. Now Ingle's pulled out a quick one, a 113.1. We saw that earlier in the race. So really getting the pedal down to the Castro hold, and Jason Bargwana going with him for a while but he's slipping back in position now so the castro holden becomes the pace setter in the queensland 500 a lot of different scenarios could unfold here this guy's staying out there on tires for a long long time 44 laps completed now now john we saw you pit on uh, something like lap 36 is that in line with your strategy or, or how's it plan how's it all sort of sitting for you at the moment actually it wasn't in line with our strategy but uh, it just seemed like an opportune time if if you have a pace car and there obviously was a, a problem with the tire although i could do late 13s early 14s it wasn't going to improve and the problem is when you get a blister the tires liable to come apart and when you do that you're pitting in uh, under a green so uh, you know at the end of the day, we'll see whether it was the right thing to do or not. You must be wrapped to have Jimmy Richards on board. Well, he's just fantastic. I, I said uh, I wish I had have driven with him years ago. He's so good, so easy on the car. He just jumps in, drives it, gets out and goes and has a cup of tea. And, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a legend, absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you, interesting thing to watch here, John, in the ex-Dick Johnson Racing Falcon, Cameron McLean, still yet to make his stop. 44 laps completed, he's just pulled out a 12.9, finds himself up into the top 10. Well, yes, Cameron's a very good driver. He's, uh, he's done some great things all year, and uh, although he's a privateer, he's certainly not a privateer in reality. Here's Jimmy Richards, the B clearance symbol, in-car and on-car camera. Jimmy, recently crowned national GT production car champion. He's as cool as, cool as a cucumber, isn't he? Isn't Actually, he doesn't look too flustered, does no, he? No, no, <laughs> oh, he's great. Just look at the telemetry on board, the Caterpillar Falcon, road speed on the left of screen, engine revolutions on the right, there's your gear change in the middle, and brake applications just there. So you can get a good idea of what's going on inside that car. It's fascinating talking to Jim about the way he drives, John. He said the reason why he's, he, he thinks he's been able to remain competitive all these years is he doesn't work the car hard. He said, I just sit there, let all the car do the work and put in the minimum amount of uh, input. Absolutely. He's, uh, for his age, and uh, that's not to denigrate his age, but for his age, he's incredibly good. And uh, I guess if you're born with talent, it keeps going. It doesn't go away when you turn 50, does it? He's just an extraordinary guy. The Kiwi, 52 years young, born in New Zealand, made Australia his home back in the mid-70s. And since then, he's been an absolute sensation. Six times Bathurst winner, two times Sandown 500 winner, four times Australian touring car champion, twice Australian GT champion. There's very little left for Jimmy Richards to win and yet he still enjoys his motorsport. Paul, Paul Radisic. Craig Lowndes, though, is the big charger at the moment. A 1.12.9 for Lowndes in the Mobile Holden Racing Team Commodore. He's up to third position, so Lowndes really on a charge. John, something different we've seen here today, too, so far. It's still early days, but we're getting the laps are 
uh, clicking over fairly quickly. Something like the top 30 cars are still on the lead lap. Well, it's uh, even though the track service and the tyre don't like each other, it still creates a very interesting race. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a long, long, long way to go yet. So there'll be lots of dramas, I'm sure, which is good for you, Bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've got something sure. to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to try and stay with it. Russell Engel, here's our race leader, the Chrome Dome. Very familiar sight throughout the Shell Series in 1999. Russell Engel looks up in the mirrors, looking very cool, calm and collected as he leads this one. A 1.13.2 for the Castrol. Holden Radisic matching him. A 1.13.27. 3.3 seconds the gap between first and second. And Craig Lowndes continuing to charge. A 1.12.97 for the mobile Commodore. There he is, coming into view. Taken Radisic, so he's up to second position. He is flying. And further back, not too far back in that shot, is Jeff Brabham, the Ford Tickford Racing AU pilot. It's hanging in there. So too Tony Longhurst. Stephen Richards has been pushed back to seventh. Then McLean. Then Dougal McDougal is still hanging in there. And well done for Romano in the Siemens car. He is up into tenth. Are you surprised at the race pace, John Bow? We heard everyone talking from one mid-12s to mid-18s. Yeah. Is this roughly where you thought it would end up? Yeah, it's about where I thought it would be. Uh, Craig uh, seems to be in very good shape as well. It's... it's uh, I don't think anybody really knows the answer to it all, and I guess next year we probably will, but uh, whoever's there at the finish with good tyres on is going to look pretty good. That's a silly thing to say, but it's a fact of life. <laughs> it is a fact of life around here. If you can keep tyres on the car, you've got to be looking competitive. After 161 laps, keep in mind 47 are coming up for 48 laps. Now that enters the, brad, the brake pad change window, that is between lap 48 and lap 112, the compulsory brake pad change can happen. Here's the guy who's going the quickest at the moment. Two times V8 supercar champ. He is going for his third this year. He leads the series by just 22 points over his teammate Mark Scape, who has had some shocking luck today. Craig Lowndes, not too far down the track, will hand the car over to fellow Victorian Cameron McConville, who we've seen do several drives this year for the John Faulkner camp. Then he filled in for Craig when he was injured and drove the car the Holden Young Lions are driving today. He's being pursued at the moment by the number 18, Shell Helix Ford of Paul Radisic. How does that feel when you see that car going around, mate? And you're, I mean, you drove it for so many years. Oh, problems oh, for Larkham. I did drive it for a long time. I had a great time for all, the, for all those years. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just like moves on and uh, I'm very happy to be with Caterpillar. We've, we're in our infancy really and I'm sure uh, we'll make our presence felt at Bathurst then next year. Brad Jones in trouble. We go on board the Mitre 10 Falcon flat tyre on the front right. Well Bradley, he's got to try and limp it back to the pits. Let's hope there's no suspension damage in there but we saw John Trimble go off with a flat tyre earlier on. So this could be the story of the race. Mark, there's starting to get quite a lot of debris out there, so that's probably why. We may see more punches as the race goes on, I think. There's Mark Larkham on screen, just watching and uh, wondering what has happened. Brad Jones bringing the Mitre 10 Ford in. The guys will make quick work of it if it is as simple as a flat tyre or a puncture. Oh, it's never a nice sound when you hear that splitter on the front grinding against the tarmac. Suspension's very close to the ground there too. Greg Rust is on the spot. Well, I've just, in fact, had a word to Mark Larkham and uh, obviously very disappointed at the moment. The word from Brad Jones is they don't quite know how the flat occurred. The boys are Bridgestone very quick and very keen to get their hands on the tyres so they can do a bit of analysis for it. But this, uh, this pit stop and Brad Jones looking very unhappy as well. They had a solid run at Bathurst last year until uh, that problem with the starter motor. So uh, this won't be pleasing him at all. Well, when Brad came in, the car was in 30th position. Done and gone. Yeah, he's not having a good race today, Mark Larkham. The Mitre 10 Falcon looked quite strong throughout uh, pre-qualifying. But now they find themselves right back in the pack. Meanwhile, Jason Bright, after that early stop, is up to 13th position. He came in and stopped under the safety car period to change tyres. And he's, now he's up to 13th slot. So he's really getting a move on. Quickest car last lap around was Paul Radisic in the number 18 Shell Helix Ford. Russell Ingle, our race leader, is in. Right, let's have a look. This will be interesting to watch the time here. So, 50 laps completed for our race leader. Greg 
Rust is on the spot. Well, the boys hoping to make this one a very slick stop indeed. Russell out of the car, LP in, just taking a quick look at the tyres. They don't actually look too bad. So John Bow's comments before about the Commodores seeming to be uh, looking after their tyres might be uh, might be quite correct. Now Larry's in the car, just waiting for the rest of the uh, the fuel to go in. A full 120 litres, 19 seconds down so far. LP eager to get going. On the car, on the ground and away, 24.7 seconds. Wow. Well, there was a time when uh, driver changes used to hold things up, John Bout. Now it's fuel going in. It's incredible how quickly they can turn those cars around. But can you believe Perkins, after such a wretched sprint season, the way this team comes together for the Enduros? Well, he's, a, he's an expert on it, and you only have to look at his Bathurst record for that. Uh, that'll be very hard to beat. Russell's last lap before he stopped was 13 dead, so you know, that's a good pace on his seatbelts there, getting them really tight as he comes out on his first lap. Keep in mind these tyres won't be quite up to their peak opting, optimum operating temperature. And that'll mean the pressures are down a little bit too. So Larry feel his way around for these test two or three laps. Craig Lowndes now takes over the lead. As we thank John Bow for your time, John. Best best of luck in the remainder of this race. Pleasure, mate. I hope I don't come back, really. I hope <laughs> I'm out there actually going around at a better speed. Now, the big okay. news is Jason Bright in the Pertec Ford has cracked the top ten. He was the first car we saw come into the pits, and he has now re-entered the top ten. So watch out for the Pertec Ford driver. He is on the way forward. Larry Perkins is in Ingalls' seat, Lowndes, Radisic and Barguana all in the pits. So we continue this fascinating contest. There's Radisic back out. Steve Ellery, I think, would be behind the wheel by now, but he's back into the pits again. Well, second time round, and we've got one of the Valvoline Cummins Commodores coming in as well. That is the Ritter Coleman car. Now, we have got Brabham, Richards, McDougall, Parsons running in the top four. They have not pitted yet. Jason Bright is effectively <laughs> leading this race. Bathurst all over again. He is currently sitting in fifth position. The Pertec Ford boys are doing another brilliant job. Problems here for the 18 Shell Helix Ford. Yeah, it just came into the pits during the break. And now only a couple of laps, maybe one lap with Stephen Ellery at the wheel. It's come back in. Problems here. Trent Hicks. Yeah, I'm down in the uh, Shell Helix pit and it looks as though they have rear brake problems. The uh, pit crew are having a look at the disc and behind the disc as we speak and the front wheels are still on. So it's definitely not tyres. They haven't come here to do that. They're popping the boot as well. They look like they could be checking brake fluid so there could be a problem with the brake lining somewhere. Yep, checking reservoir levels there for the hydraulic fluid in the brakes. They might have a leak. Looks like they're going to top up those reservoirs, the master cylinder reservoirs for the Brakes Thanks, hydraulic man. system. It looks like a problem early on for Paul Radisich and Stephen Ellery after running so strongly in that opening sure, stint. Sure, Castrol Ford of Tony Longhurst and Adam Macro in the pits as well. Don't know what's going on there. That was, I think, supposed to be a scheduled stop, but he's been in there for quite a while. Yeah. So drama upon drama. They said it was going to be a tough race. Well, it's certainly proving that way. What are they doing? They're putting the, uh, putting That's the air Macro. guns away. Adam Macro just sitting there. Goodness me. The young guy, the former Formula Ford champ. And there is not much happening at the Longhurst pit. Got the uh, stricken Shell 18 Ford behind it. Yep, they're putting it up on those jacks. They're going to wheel that Bring thing away. In. Yeah. So that's a major disappointment for Tony Longhurst. This is happening right in front of where... Ellery is sitting in the number 18 Shell Helix Ford. Greg's down in the pits with Tony. Well, Tony, this is not what you wanted to see happen at this stage of the race. The boys are wheeling it into the garage. What's happened? Um, looks like the throttle switch has moved, so I've lost the cylinder. So we've just got to plug the electronics in and just see. But, you know, so disappointing. I was doing it so comfortably and was sneaking up, saving the tyres. But, you know, it's an endurance race. This is what happens every time. What you've got to do is get out there and circulate. No mistakes from the driver, no mistakes from the car, and uh, you end up on the podium. Hard luck. Thank you. Tough yeah. day here at uh, Queensland Raceway already. So Longhurst heads back into his garage to find out what that problem is. Trent Higgs? I've got Paul Radisic with me. Um, Paul, everything seemed to be moving along nicely, but now you seem to have some kind of brake problem. Yeah, everything was going along nice. We are just noosing the car, conserving the tyres, and just running to a strategy, and everything was good. We had a little bit of a long pedal to start with, and uh, eventually it just pumped all the fluid out of the, uh, out of the system, so we lost the hydraulic pressure. So now we've got to find out exactly um, yeah. where the problem is. Do you think you'll be able to get that back out on the track fairly soon, or it's a bit hard to say? Well, I would think so. Obviously, we're just going to lose a bit of time, so um, give me something to chase for at the end of the day. 
Oh, it's a shame, isn't mm, it? Never something you want to see. Brake fluid coming out. Craig Lowndes, our race leader, tinted earlier on during the commercial break. And we'll just give you an update on that. It was a pretty clean Ready stop. Cameron McConville getting in. Jeff Gregg, the team manager, giving the windscreen a scrub, getting rid of all the bugs and the dirt. Well, look how debris. relaxed Craig is. Just yeah. shuts the door, bang, done. McConville in, ready to go. There's no panic there whatsoever. And that is the most effective way to complete pit stops. Out goes Cameron McConville. And a very slick job. I'll tell you what, I was talking to him yesterday and he was saying, yeah, I reckon we can do it on two stops. I honestly believe it. And uh, at that time, you had to take it with a grain of salt because every driver and every team engineer was giving you a different story. But yeah. certainly the proof in the pudding. Lowndes coming in at lap 54. That's bang on target for two stops. This is back live. And Jeff Brabham in the Ford Tickford Racing AU teamed with three times Australian Rally Champ Neil Bates for this and also the FAI 1000. Currently leads the race but is yet to pit. So too Stephen Richards, who was behind him in the wins Kmart Commodore. Dougal McDougal in the Allo Quench VT. Now there's one and two on the track at the moment, but keep in mind these guys must pit very soon. And speaking of it, here comes Brabham. Let's see if Stephen Richards stays out there. Yep, he's staying out in the wins machine. So Stephen Richards continuing to circulate. First stop yet to come for the Gibson Motorsport machine. And they have been doing some wonderful jobs with fuel mileage over the years. Could that be a winning tactic today? As Jeff Brabham brings it into the pit lane to hand over to three times Australian rally champion Neil Bates, 34 year old Canberra resident. Greg Rust. Well, real problems down here, Mark. Unfortunately, when Jeff got himself out of the car, he left the car in gear. He's let the clutch go as he, he climbed out. The wheels, the back wheels kept spinning. So the boys working the back tyres couldn't get to the wheel nuts to undo the tyres. So this stop, I think you'll find, will go a little longer than expected. A few moments ago, the Parsons boys were both in as well. They changed the front pads on that car, so they're doing quite well. Neil Bates in gear, unfortunately, stalls it. But for the Ford Tickford Racing Team, a stop of around about 33 seconds. Yeah, well, a longer than what they would have hoped for, mm. but the main thing is Bright is out, uh, rather Bates is out in the car now, the number 17, Shell Helix Ford, Steve Johnson bringing the car in. He's hanging, handing it over to Dad Dick in his 200th Shell Championship Series start. Trent? We've got Queensland's favourite son jumping into the car now. Dick taking over from son Steve. Um, the Shell Helix team working overtime here. Looks like they're just trying to get these wheels off. They're having a few problems with the rear ones as we speak. Um, they're taking it off, they're chopping the fuel up. And it's taking these tyres off now, but putting a fresh set on. So at the moment, their tyre problems seem to be OK. I spoke to their team manager. Yeah, well, they must be hanging in there if they brought him in on lap 62. So all sorts of tactics coming to emerge here. Stephen talking to his dad. It's 200th Shell Series appearance. Not sure if the radio is working there between Steve and Dick, but he's certainly got the message, I think. So Johnson waiting for his last appearance in a shell round in front of this big Queensland crowd. A very emotional day for the Queenslander. And they're going to get him back into action. It's been a less than flash stop. Some delays here. As Trent was saying before, they had some trouble with wheel nuts, I think. Feverish work going on on the sister car, the Shell 18 Ford. Stephen Ellery still sitting in at the steering wheel. And Dick Johnson comes back out lap 62 for the Shell 78 Ford. Now the current race leader in the wins came out Commodore, Steve Richards. We wait to see Stephen Pitt and he's in there now. He has come into the pit lane. So Jason Bright will take over the lead of the Queensland 500 in the Pertec Ford. Here comes the wins boys. Look at Greg Murphy. He's ready to pounce. <laughs> Looks like he's about to run a 100 metre sprint there. Greg Rust is on the spot. Well, aren't these guys fired up and... Uh... You can understand it because the, this particular team has a history of getting good economy out of their cars and it looks as though they're doing exactly that today. Now the team have run onto the, uh, the front wheels as well because they're going to change the front brake pads here so they're, uh, they're completing that mandatory stop. Stevie's out with the hands in the air, Murph is all strapped in ready to go, the fuel going in, 23 seconds gone so far. The front pads just going back in, the front tyres now going back on, this is a fairly slick stop. Yeah, good work from the Gibson Motorsport team. Well drilled in endurance competition. Great driving combination of Stephen Richards and Greg Murphy. Murphy back out of the action. The car looking like...
like it's running strong at this stage. Let's not forget that the Murph picked up second at the Sensational Adelaide 500. So this team very, very good at endurance racing. They are back out there. This is the car that Greg has campaigned all this year. This is the new race leader. Lap 65 of 161. He has been quickest in every single session this weekend. Practice and qualifying and the top 10. Jason Bright in the Pertec Ford. Yet to hand over to Kiwi teammate Craig Baird. A very accomplished driver in his own right. Of course, raced in the British Touring Car Championship last year. He did a stint in the Super Tourers in South Africa for BMW. And we've seen him drive in the V8 Supercars. Just a couple of years ago, he drove for the Shell Helix team. And he has been doing very competitive times and is a perfect match for Bright. They did not have to change one thing. So we look forward to Craig Baird getting in the car. It is Bright at the moment, and he is right on the challenge recruitment. VT Commodore, the Parsons-Parsons combination, Truckee and Skippy. What a brilliant piece of driving by the Greenfield Mowers car. That was earlier off tape. Here is another angle. Watch the back right tyre. And Cameron really had his hands full there. The Greenfield yeah. car. Now we're seeing a lot of deflated tyres. Valvoline Cummins driver Jason Barguana joins us in commentary. Jason, you are saying when we were off air that uh, you believe it's not debris, it's a lot of blistered tyres. Yeah, well, there's a number of cars. I've sort of had a bit of a wander up and down pit lane after I got out of the car and I saw a lot of blistered tyres. I mean, mine come off looking quite nice, but, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of blistered tyres out there. Well, we saw the Trimble Heffernan car a short time ago have a second flat front left. Now we saw the uh, the Allen Heath entry car that was off at the... Uh, the outside of the main straight whether that was a flat as well but there's plenty happening at the moment yeah we're just doing our sums on the per tech forward or trouble there for alan heath and warren luff in the falcon warren luff at the wheel and he's just parked it down the end of or off the pit exit lane so the car start to fall pretty rapidly now tires in trouble mechanical problems here's our race leader jason bright we we're just saying we're doing our sums he came and stopped early on uh, lap 24. We were wondering if he could get away with a two-stop strategy, and that would require him going 68 laps. So I'll tell you what. This is McLean Todd, in again. Todd Kelly, who's running second, has just done 69 laps. So it is possible to do that race distance. I wonder if the uh, Pertec boys are looking at taking Jason right out to lap 93. Yeah. That will put him right back on a two-stop strategy. Well, this is hurting the Greenfield Mowers team. McLean in yet again. And the word we get through is that the wheel actually fell off as he came back into the pits. So hard stuff there for Cameron McLean. How have you found it so far, Jason? Mate, I'm having a ball out there. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, the Babel and Cummins Commodore is obviously working very well at the start there, uh, looking after three tyres, and I just uh, kept, kept on with it. Well, we were saying that uh, the general talk was that you couldn't afford to get caught up in too many battles if you were going to make your tyres last and, and to fit with your strategy. We noticed that you gave Russell Engel plenty of room and let him on by. You didn't really contest that. Yeah, at the start of the race, it was like, yeah, after you, yeah, no, no problem, after you, yeah, no, OK. It, um, so when Russell came up behind me, obviously, we, the uh, the tyre was a bit cold after the restart there, and uh, I couldn't do much about it, so... Now, on the track at the moment, these two cars are currently first and second, but keep in mind that Kelly, well, and uh, pushing hard in the My Car, number 15 machine, and is about to pit. He ran very wide there. Yes, he is. Yeah. Here we go. So that was very scheduled. They were going extremely long, 70 laps. So that's a big stint for that car. So now that we'll see Jim Richards move up into second position and McConville into third. And your boy Garth Tander will be running fourth. That's not too bad at this stage. No, it's good. Obviously, we've got a, uh, a plan to keep the car consistent throughout the day. The tyres are a big issue. I mean, everyone's been talking about it, obviously. And uh, it's about a matter of looking after him. So I noticed you're saying there that, that Bridie can go almost to the end and, and do another stop. But um, we've got one stop to go, obviously. But I'd hate to be on his tyres at the end of that. <laughs> Pad change here for the Young Lions car, Greg Rust. The stop's been going around about 15 seconds now. Kelly is in the car, Noski out, as you said, they're doing the front pads. Just having a look at the tyres, and again, this car, this is a, an older model VS, the Young Lions entry. It looks like it's looking after its tyres just superbly. The boys have got the pads in, they're putting the front wheels back on. 30 seconds gone so far. Full of, uh, full of fuel, and Kelly will be on the way very shortly. This is, of course, the golden car that Craig Lowndes won the 1996 championship in Sandown and Bathurst. It's also the same car that Greg Murphy clouted the wall with at Phillip Island. They rebuilt it, and it's the same car 
that both Lowndes and McConville raced earlier this year. Rodney Forbes putting a move on the Toll Falcon, the Trat Jones entry, and they get back out there. I'll tell you what, Jason Bugwana, looking at that tyre that came off that car, it looked like it was pretty healthy. Yeah, I mean, it's not hard to look after the tyre. Obviously, speed is the, the determining factor, so you can push pretty hard. Pull. You can see there, obviously, that tyre's well grained, so <laughs> as soon as you start standing on the power, the, the, the rear of the car steps out, so it's a bit of a, bit of a nightmare, I've got to tell you. That was Larry Perkins carving his way through, currently in seventh position. Now he's just moved up one. You can count that as sixth. Now, how are you? How is uh, your performance at the moment going in line with your strategy? Is everything on cue? Absolutely. And at the start of the race, we we sat down and we had a bit of a plan, and, and we just kept going at it. And I didn't actually mean to pull away as much as I did at the start there, but I just wanted to continue the, the pace in the car. I, I felt pretty comfortable, and it's uh, it's working together for us at the moment. So there was one restart there uh, after the safety car had left the circuit where you had a massive gap. There was you on Radisic, uh, and you had quite a healthy gap on Radisic, and it was miles back to third. Did you realise that you'd got that much of a jump on them? No, not at all. I was just out there just doing my laps, keeping my times consistent, having a ball. I mean, I was really enjoying myself out there. Um, then they said, come in. I went, oh, do I have to? I guess the critical thing too, Jason, is keeping your car in enough shape that if we get a safety car period, say 20, 30, maybe 10 laps from the end, you've got to be able to sprint for the win, don't you? Well, that, that, that is obviously going to be an important factor. There's Garth there, go Garthy. <laughs> but um, obviously uh, the safety car sort of stuffed us up a bit there. I was quite comfortable with it. Well, under the safety car, the brakes and the tyres cool down a bit, so it makes it pretty hard. Tanda moves Tanda. up yeah, yep. into third position now. That was Cameron McConville that he put the move on. McConville back to fourth now, and Tanda is looking good. That last lap, a 1.14, Bright a 1.13. In fact, Jason Bright, the only car in that 1.13 bracket, but this is looking smooth. The car looks great, Jason. It does, and it's really been working well. I mean, obviously, Winton is our test track. Uh, works a little bit in our favour here because the surface is the same. And if you remember back at the uh, Winton round, I, I had a, didn't have a problem riding your tyres. I looked after them a fair bit, and Garth was in the same situation. So, hey, I reckon it's looking good at the moment. I mean, uh, what I'll be third at the moment, so it's a long way from home. How's it working with your driver changes? I mean, there's some 22 odd centimetres difference in your height. <laughs> so, how, how's your little your, your little dicky seat and the, the the separate belts working? That's all going okay? Yeah, well, we've been practicing a fair bit, and we've got it down to a fairly quick time, around 14 seconds. So. Uh, the fuel's taking about 18 seconds, the tyres are taking around about the 15 second mark, so we can actually do it quicker than the guys can. Um, obviously we're only going to do it one more time now, I've got to get back in and slide my, slide my little seat in there and, uh, and have a bit of a go, so we'll be right. Minor 10 lap counter, lap 75 of 161, we're clicking on through them, down to the pits, Greg. Greg can't hear us at the moment. Looks like he's getting a little bit sideways coming out of that corner. They're working the car hard. Jason Bright at 1.13.5 as he leads this race. 25 seconds the gap over Richards in second. Greg? Well, well, I'm down here at the moment with Craig. Man, you're, you've are you got the helmet on ready to go. Craig, is everything going to plan? Yeah, everything's going to plan. The car's running well. Jason's done a pretty long stint. He's uh, just about done a double stint down here, but uh, that's what we've planned on. So uh, I'll jump in the car and do a long stint now myself. There was a bit of concern from the team about one of the back tyres after that previous stop. Has he just been nursing the tyres? Yeah, just been running the car, just making sure we're conservative on the tyres. Obviously, the first stint was difficult for Jason because it was a sort of testing period for us as well. But uh, it was a plan and the car's got quite a good lead there at the moment. So uh, wouldn't mind a yellow in about two laps. <laughs> well, as I throw it back to you boys, I can tell you also the cloud, cover, the cloud cover rather has come over a little bit. That's dropping the track temperature slightly. Well, we got a word earlier that it had grown to 38 degrees Celsius. Earlier in the day when we had some cloud cover and it dropped to 28. So it's going up and down quite a bit. That'll be making the uh, the tyres <laughs> work very, very Whoa. hard. And I'm sure the drivers and teams won't mind it if it cools down quite a bit. Jason Bright in the Pertec Ford. We are about to see a transition. Craig Baird will step into the car. Former New Zealand touring car champ will take the Pertec Ford out on Queensland Raceway. Sliding there, it looks quite good yeah. from my point of view. Yeah. You'd like to see more of that? <laughs> tell you what, he's been doing some good times though, Jason. The 1.13.5, his last time around, that is the fastest on the track at the moment, consistently has been toward the end of this stint. So, yeah. Bright really pushing the Pertec forward hard. Craig Baird, his teammates, standing in pit lane waiting. We're wondering if they're going to try and stretch it out to lap 93 to get uh, 68 laps remaining. 
It looks like they're going to run right, right to the end. A very, very low fuel load. Take the tyres right to the end. Oh, it could be in any lap now. It's really hard to uh, get a consistent lap out there with the traffic. But, um, obviously, you're catching guys at different times. They're in a battle themselves. So you've got to weed through the traffic. And it actually makes it quite difficult to uh, keep your time where you want to do it. Sometimes it can be blown out by a second and a half. But uh, I suppose it's the same for everyone. So we've just got to get on with it and go and have some fun. I guess all that weaving around, that's putting more strain on the tyres than if you're just driving a nice, straight, consistent lap. Yeah, it's more the actual cornering force on the tyre that, that really hurts it. You turn into the corner and you've really got to look after the tyre and you're turning. If you're turning hard, it works the tyre sideways whilst you're trying to drive it forward as well. So you try and slow the car down on the turning, straighten the car up, get in the power hard and, and really punch it out of the corner. Now the number 17 Shell Helix car back in, set in 19th position and Brad Jones in the Mitre 10 Ford. We saw those guys suffer some tyre problems earlier. Also, Brad is currently sitting in 20th position, so a lot of work to do. Glenn Seaton is in 13th. He has recovered. Andrew Medici has taken over from Dougal McDougal in the Allo Quench VT, currently running 11th. There's some guys in the top 10 who are working extremely hard. David Skippy Parsons. Skippy has taken over from Truckee. He's running in 10th. Thomas Mazira in the Siemens Mobiles. That is the Paul Romano car. Mazira is currently ninth. Simon Wills in the second of the Wins Kmart racing cars. Wills has taken over from Faulkner and is currently running in eighth. Murphy is seventh. Bates is sixth. Perkins is fifth. McConville is fourth. Tander currently running third. A great job. He is so smooth. Jim Richards in the Cat Ford is sitting in second. And Bright, the man on screen, is still leading the way. Larry Perkins is renowned as the Enduro expert. But I tell you what, the Stone Brothers Racing and Jason Bright, they are really doing a tremendous job of late in these long distance races. Jason Bright, very strong qualifier throughout the Shell Championship Series in 1999. In fact, the only man to qualify in the top five in every round. It's been a phenomenal performance by the Stone Brothers operation based on the Gold Coast. Word we hear from the pits is they're going to go for a pad change this time around as well. 77 laps completed for our race leader, Jim Richards, in the Caterpillar Ford, number 600, back in second position, 28 seconds behind the Pertec Falcon, Garth Tander and Jason Barguana hanging in third, 3.8 seconds behind the Caterpillar Ford. Word from the pits, Tony Longhurst in the Castrol Ford has retired. So Longhurst is out of his home race, that is a shame. Now here we go, we've got some four drivers all in a row here. That is Greg Crick in the KNJ Radiators car. Teamed up with young Paul Wheel. Bright puts the inside move on him. Great to see Greg back. There's the Darcy Russell. Short entry, somebody else has gone off also just in front of that car. Oh, look, he's got a flat tyre. That is Darcy Russell in the gravel trap. And Bright is weaving his way through these slower cars. That's got to be tough. I know you mentioned it earlier. Whoa, oh. the inside move there by Tratt. Or is it that's Alan Jones behind the wheel now? 1980 World Formula One champion making his return to V8 Supercar. Ducks up the inside of the race leader. And Bright now will try and get that position back. These two, of course, drove together for the Stone Brothers operation a couple of years back. Teammates in the Sandown 500 and the FAI 1000. But now very much separate teams. Jason Bright continues on his way. Safety car is on the circuit. Now this is surely due to that Darcy Russell incident and the other car also. I guess we're going to see a lot more punctures, Jason Bargwana, because there's so much debris getting dragged onto the track with all these uh, slides. Yeah, oh, look at that. He's just... Oh, maybe it's something other than a flat tyre. It looks like a lot of smoke coming out of the back of the car, but you step offline, you can just see in the picture there, if you step offline, there's a lot of rubber and rocks and dirt and, and garbage all over the place. So um, you really have to keep the car in line, especially when, when you're lapping this traffic. It uh, makes it quite difficult. The other cars, we see the number five for Tickford Racing AU come on in. Now we should see Neil Crompton jump in the car here. Seaton to exchange and Crompton to get in. Here we go. Actually watching that safety car too. It came out just in front of Jason Bright. Greg Rust. Well, pads going in, Mark, on the uh, the Ford Tickford Racing uh, Falcon. I tell you what, a lot of flames coming from those brake pads too. Extremely warm, those pads. The boys working away there. We'll get some tyres on it very shortly. Neil Crompton in the car. Glenn Seaton out. We've got pit stop pandemonium happening here. Larry Perkins has just swung in in the Castrol Commodore. And the Pertec team are standing by. Craig Baird waiting to get aboard the number one car. They're all making the most of this safety car period. That happens very quick, Jason Barguana. 
Yeah, it does. Obviously, the team manager's got to think on their feet, and uh, it's a situation now. We've seen cars run to, to this point in the race, but you've got to remember they've all got to stop twice. It's part of the rules, so uh, even if you did get to halfway, you've still got to come in again. Nobody loves endurance racing more than Neil Crompton. He's a bit of a specialist at it. He loves that. We saw him as the quickest car out on the circuit towards the end of the FAI 1000 last year, and we'll see how he goes this time round. Brake pad change for the Castrol Perkins car. Russell Ingle heading over to Larry Perkins earlier in the race. Perkins now takes opportunity under the safety car to make that Whoa. compulsory brake pad change. Just Did misses that, that air hose. <laughs> yep. And there's penalties for cars that run over air hoses. So that was a pretty close run for Larry Perkins. He'll join the back of the queue. If you ever wanted to see how to put five nuts on very quickly, that goes. was Oscar Fiorinotto doing that. That was a brilliant job as our race leader is in the pits. Craig Baird will take over the Pertec Ford. Craig Baird, the 29-year-old Kiwi, three times winner of the New Zealand Grand Prix, a specialist in both touring car and open wheeler cars, a tremendously talented driver. Greg Rust will call the stop, and here's our race leader peeling off from that safety car period. He'll join the back of the queue. Greg? Well, hopefully this should be a very slick stop, Mark. Jason Bright getting out of the car. The boys are going to do the front pads here. Very quickly onto, I tell you, a lot of steam coming from the front of this car as well. So these brakes are being tortured around Queensland Raceway at the moment. The Bridgestone boys having a, uh, a bit of a look at the tyres, and they don't look too bad at this point in time. They look, in fact, better than the first set that came off the car in that very early first stop. Very calculated uh, move, this, in terms of their early stop. Bertie's all strapped in, ready to go now. And off the uh, off the jacks, on the deck, just over 30 seconds, including front pads. That's a, that's a slick stop. Three separate shots there from our helmet cam. Gary Bennett from the Pertec Ford team wearing that helmet cam for us. You can see how quickly it all happens. Brad Jones is back in, in the Mitre 10 Ford. More time in the pits. Of course, we saw them have that unscheduled stop earlier which has cost them and sent them back to 20th position outright. Neil Bates in the second of the Ford Tickford Racing Falcons is officially fourth from Greg Murphy, Craig Baird, Larry Perkins. Don't forget the FAI 1000 Classic double points in the Shell Championship Series on offer again in the big one from Mount Panorama. There are the dates and there are the times on air for Network 10. You will not miss a thing. What a great race is unfolding here, Lee Diffie. Yeah, and a reminder too for that November weekend, it is the only chance you will see the V8 supercars at Mount Panorama. Tanda is back in the lead. He is doing well in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. Jason Barguana, we've had to get the ropes and tie him down. He's that excited. Things are looking good. Oh, yeah, I started cheering there as I saw that, that's for sure. No, look, it's, uh, it's obviously a nice move he put on, uh, he put on uh, Jimmy there, so it was uh, looking really good, and hopefully we just keep it up. Well, mate, we know you've got to get back down into the pits and prepare uh, for your next uh, stint, so thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it, and uh, best of luck for the rest of the race. Yeah, no, thanks, guys. I hope I can uh, say hello on the podium up there, <laughs> seeing up there well, in first place. But, I hope uh, so. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to, all the, uh, thanks to all the fans that sent the faxes and letters in this week, and uh, yeah, yeah. hopefully we can do it for you. Well, thanks to the fans, and I might also remind you we've got a, uh, a sweepstake going with the 10 commentary team. My money's on you, so uh, you better bring yeah. it home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, 50 bucks you're going to send me? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Cameron guys. McConville, who is sitting in second position in the number one Mobile One Holden Racing Team Commodore. He's doing well, the young Victorian. Now, here is the replay of the overtaking move for the lead. Jim Richards in the Cat Ford giving Tander enough room to slip on through. Second place man, Cameron McConville, doing a great job co-driver for Craig Lowndes, the reigning Australian V8 supercar champion. Flashes past the start-finish line once again to commence another lap. 84 laps down in the 161 lap contest. 25-year-old McConville from Melbourne. He's got a great racing pedigree behind him. Australian GTP champion, Australian Formula 4 champion. And very strong in super touring when he drove for the Audi team guy who's driven a lot of different cars in his career for one so young and puts him in good stead for a big future in these machines. Greg Murphy is up into fourth in the wins Kmart Commodore so the Kiwi is on a big surge forward he's got past Neil Bates, Baird 
is back in sixth. Larry Perkins is seventh. Skippy Parsons eighth. Mazira ninth. And Andrew Madiki in the Dougal McDougal. Allo Quench Commodore is currently running in tenth. Now, this will be interesting because if this car wins and it was at least right up there in the points and it becomes very obvious that Scaife cannot win this year's Shell Championship Series, we will see Lowndes and Scaife drive together at Bathurst. That's been the word that has been uh, passed around. Once it has been, well, it's uh, conclusive that one or the other is out of the title hunt. They will put their best pairing together, which is, of course, Lowndes and Scaife. So we'll see McConville and Morris drive together at the FAI 1000. At the moment, it's McConville who's doing the job. Now, let's look back here and see if we can get a look at Murphy. There is Jimmy Richards in the Caterpillar Ford, currently third on track. Neil Bates just behind him in the second of the FTR Falcons. From pit lane, Greg Rust. Well, I thought it around the half race distance, it might be a, an opportune time to talk to the head of Bridgestone Motorsports tyres operation. Graham Brown, uh, how are things going? Generally, very good. Better than I expected. Um, with um, a lot of the teams here that have worked hard over the last couple of days with this car set up, which is the, the, like the most difficult part for this, for this circuit, uh, they've worked hard and they've really come up with a package that is better than what I've expected. The temperature here at the moment a little cooler than the start of the race as well, that's probably helping. It is assisting, definitely, uh, but there again, uh, it's still really up to the driver. It's a, a, the drivers that are driving straight, thinking about what they're doing, resting their tyres when they can, are the guys that are going to be out the front there uh, towards the end of the race. I think that pretty well sums it up, boys. Yeah, but in defence of Bridgestone, we must point out that this year V8s have switched to a control tyre. That is, they have to run the same construction and compounded tyre at every round of the Shell Championship Series. Now, when you take into account all the different track services, the different track conditions these cars have to cope with, Bridgestone has to build a tyre to try and cope with a multitude of different situations. Now, at this track, it's a very low grip surface. Other tracks, it's a very grippy surface. So, at some tracks, they may struggle. Some, they may be very good. And that's the difficulty when you're supplying a control tyre for a series like this. You've got to try and make a tyre that will cover all situations. All in all, they've done a brilliant job this year, Bridgestone. Graham Brown and his team have brought 1,300 tyres to the Queensland Raceway circuit this weekend. And his team, Kevy Fitzsimmons and the boys, have worked very hard and it's not only in terms of just fitting wheels with the tyres but it's educating and it's talking the teams about how to get talking to the teams the managers the drivers how to get the most out of these tyres dick johnson at the wheel of the shell 17 ford great day for dick His final shell series appearance in front of a big queensland crowd and look at his face look at the way he blinks there he is really struggling with this sinus problem that's affected him for a number of years now it's so bad that his eyes get quite watery he gets headaches he gets distracted it's been very very tough for the 54 year old queenslander you know it's been the hardest for him recently yeah. is the amount of public appearances <laughs> he said i just can't keep up with it he had to give one away the other morning he was just exhausted and uh, of course on top of that he's had his testimonial or farewell dinners which have been very successful right around the country and Dick is out there at the moment, lap 88 of 161, trying to work his way forward. Trent Higgs? Well, down in the pit lane, I have um, Dick's son, Steve, with me. Steve, how, how have you seen things this afternoon so far? Oh, Trent, it's probably, probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, I can tell you. But, um, you know, we've done some testing here uh, throughout the weeks, leading up not too much. And um, we did 50-odd laps, not a problem in the 12s and 13s, and come race day, she's... Uh, turned around and gone the other way so I mean it's fairly tough work there was no rubber left on the tyre when we come back in it was all canvas so um, managed to stay out there for 60 laps so we'll leave the old man out there for 55 and jump in and do the end part. Well thanks Steve well it's a more disastrous outlook for the number 18 car I have Steve Ellery with me here Steve you've got some terminal brake problems that the team has been unable to solve so it's forced the car out? Yeah it's very disappointing uh, Paul started the race in fourth and um, led parts of the race. We were running second when he came into the pits. He'd, he'd just driven absolutely fantastic today and um, I guess probably more disappointing for him because he's done all the hard work and the team, that's probably very shattering for them because they put a lot of time and effort into this and just to have a little problem like this happen, something's wrong with the brakes, we haven't found it yet, I don't think it's too major, um, but unfortunately it's just put us out for the day and I guess the word from here is we're just a little bit shattered at the moment. Commiseration. Yeah, thanks Trent.
Yeah, tough day for the Shell team, but boy, this is a competitive race. 22 seconds covers the top seven, and they're all on the lead lap. Anyone can win this race. This is an incredible contest. Very, very close. The 17 Shell Helix Ford currently in 13th position. And word from the ground, there has been oil spotted coming from the back of the number 11 car. That is the Castrol Perkins car. That would be disastrous for Larry. He is that seventh car on the lead lap. They have completed 87. They're on their 88. Now on 89. Tell you what, too, the Garth Tander and Jason Bargwan, a combination. Tander in the car at the moment, he is grinding them into the ground. A 1.12.8, previously to 1.12.6. Lap 88, his previous lap was a 1.12.6, one of the fastest laps in the race. So the Valvoline Cummins machine absolutely on fire here. Car 34, with Garth Tander at the wheel, leading this race. 2.9 seconds the lead over Cameron McConville in the mobile Holden Racing Team Commodore. Jimmy Richards still in third position, some 5.3 seconds behind the mobile machine. There, that is Jason Bright's teammate contesting the championship, the Shell Championship, but at the moment, Conk McConville, who's of course driving for Craig Lowndes in the championship, so to speak, Lee Diffie, in a very, very good position. He should get some big points if he can hang on to that sort of thing. So too is this guy, Garth Tander, the 22-year-old from Melbourne, originally from WA. He gave us a bit of a scare not so long ago. He dropped from the 130s, that's Mark Scaife in more trouble, with Paul Morris behind the wheel. Now, Heading through the midsection of the circuit. There was a bit of dust flying there. He just ran a little wide by the looks of it and run what runs wide again, but doesn't come into the pit lane. So I wonder if Paul's experience some experiencing some tire problems. There's something coming out of the back of the car there, some liquid. Getting back to Tanda, he's circulating in the 113s quite consistently and all of a sudden slowed and did a 116. One minute, 16 second lap, and then all of a sudden got back on the power again. So a little bit confusing, but Tanda still leads the inaugural Queensland 500. Might have hit some traffic out there. Let's have a look at that on the Shell Helix replay. Paul Morris struggling with this car after a collision with Jason Bright's Pertec Ford in the opening laps. Mark Scape was at the wheel. They have been struggling. All sorts of damage. Conville's just run a little bit wide in car one. So car two continues, but it's many, many laps down on the lead up. It was a terrible start to the race for Skate and the mobile team. Craig Lowndes and Cameron McConville still right up there, well in contention for this race. There it is. Car one with McConville at the wheel. 96 laps completed of 161. And a very slow lap there. McConville did run wide, a 119.8 for the co-driver. So, as we saw Tanda suffer before, there's all sorts of obstacles out there at the moment. Now, while we've been talking about plenty of new driving combinations, one combo that has been together, it seems, for eternity, is Steve Reed and Trevor Ashby. They are the top place privateers in 10th position. It is an outstanding effort. They are doing a very good job. And they are just behind Thomas Mazira. Thomas has done a terrific job in the Siemens Mobiles car. Whoa, this is, that's the John Trimble, Kevin Heffernan oh, car. This is the third time they've come off today. They're having a real grip problem here. Flat tyre the first time around. Saw them run offline a second with the second flat tyre. This time they've come off at turn two, the fastest corner on the track. So they're having a rotten day. I think the Gatorade car might have a few problems here too. This is the Cotter Dorman entry. This is the former Russell Ingle car they've recently purchased. You may remember Peter Dorman had a huge crash at Oran Park at the final sprint round. He is okay. The car wasn't. They were intending on purchasing that one anyway, and they pushed it through very hard. All of their sponsors and helpers did a magnificent job to get the car painted up in the Gatorade colour scheme and get it on the track. They were going quite slow down the main straight. And right behind them is the car we were just talking about, the top place privateers, Steve Reed and Trevor Ashby, the two Sydney-based drivers. Oh, he came in there way too hot. He was off the racing line, got out on the ripple strips, completely lost it. And managed to keep it off those tyres, but boy, those guys are having a tough day at the office. Here's the Gatorade car coming onto the pit straight. Another replay. This may tell us why. Well, that's why. 
can't go down the pit straight backwards. So Zoe Tia is having a tough time of it out there, as is everyone from the leader to last. When we caught the Gatorade car, obviously they were just regrouping. Now there's so a great battle there. If you look a bit further down the road, Greg Murphy right behind our second place man, Cameron McConville. This is the battle for second position. Murphy has been on a charge. Well, it's shades of Adelaide. When it counted, Murphy was there in the wins Kmart Commodore. And here he is, currently placed third. He was determined to do well here today. He was as high as second in the Shell Championship Series after the Sensational Adelaide 500 and has been on a downward slide ever since. He currently sits in eighth position in the overall series points and is looking to put a move on Cameron McConville. Oh, He's so close, how close not to make contact there. Very close. Plenty of intensity there from Greg Murphy getting hot and heavy with the mobile number one Commodore. The battle for second position. Garth Tander some 15 seconds up the road. We're approaching three digits in this race in terms of lap distance. 100 laps, very close. Lap 98 for our race leader. He's about to clock up 99, so 161 laps. Still a long way to go after this one. And the battle for the lead still as intense. Look how Murphy really zeroes in on the back of the Mobile One car. Fire out of turn six, back onto the pit straight once again. And they said all year, talking to Fred Gibson, the team manager, he watched us in the Enduros. They were very confident. And here's the proof in the pudding. You may have noticed that person looking over pit wall. That was Jeff Brabham, eagerly watching how Neil Bates is going in the second Ford Tickford Racing AU. In fact, on the track, they are the top-placed car. Two hours, 13 minutes have elapsed here at the inaugural Queensland 500 as they flash up the back straight one more time, reaching speeds of 247, 248 kilometres an hour, right the way back to 77. It's one of the slowest two corners on the circuit as they approach the most difficult part of the circuit. Through the middle two turns, the drivers say you've got to make it one turn to be effective. If you turn in too late, too early, you are in trouble. Right here now, talk about landscaping for the Greenfield Mowers team. This is Cameron McClay for the second time about to lose the front left wheel and even more serious problems coming up here. Lee Diffie and Mark Osler. This could be a real hazard if more than that wheel comes off. Look at the sparks there. It's and incredible. the disc. Oh, the disc come away as well. Something on fire inside the wheel rim. Poor old Wayne Park taking over the car from Cameron McConville. We saw him. Look at the disc. Cutting a swathe across the road onto the grass. We want to pick that thing up and cook your breakfast on that. Well, Wayne Park, it's a very scary moment for him. We saw it happen to Cameron on the back straight as it oh. just gouges its way through the infield. That is the day for the Greenfield Mowers team. And Wayne Park, this is his only drive with the Greenfield team in the Enduros. Of course, John Clellan stepping in, so not a happy day for him. And here comes the Caterpillar Ford. Car running. Right up in the top five, Greg Rust. Well, Jimmy Richards getting out of the car. John Bowers eagerly waiting for this one to get back behind the wheel. This car doing reasonably well at the moment. Now there's a problem with the jacks. They've got a problem with the jacks. They can't get the yep. car completely up off the ground. The boys are diving for the gas at the moment, trying to pump some more air through it so they can actually get those air jacks up and get the car off the ground. They can't do that at the moment. So they haven't completed the, uh, the tire stop. Problems for the fuel as well. Oh, there's been a flame. There's a flame here. Goodness me, that happened very suddenly. The boys took the vent bottle out of the back of the car. Officials very smartly are on top of this. And what happened, the uh, the guy who was pumping the fuel into the car, goodness me, I was right near that. He kept pumping the fuel in there. Now, what has happened, I'd say, is it's overflowed out of the uh, the tank and gone down onto the exhaust. It's ignited for, for the briefest of moments and gone out. So there's a lot of... Um, a lot of protective foam that's been sprayed down here. The problem still remains. 58 seconds gone. They can't get this car off the ground and they can't change the tyres. That is disastrous despite the obvious danger. They were well placed. And that was a very scary moment for the Cat Ford team. Tell you what, full marks to the guys with the fire extinguishers. Though. They were in there very, very quickly. That's a view from our camera on the back of the Caterpillar Ford. It's covered in fire retardant foam. And gee, it puts a chill up your back when you think of what refueling and touring car races used to be like even 20 years ago. Guys just in short sleeve shirts and caps. Now they're in the full flame retardant gear. 
Fire marshals at the ready. It's a much better situation now. And you can see accidents can happen even with a dry brake system. And everyone very lucky to get out of that one. But John Bow, problems with the pneumatic system on the jacks. They can't get the car into the air. If they can't get into the air, they can't change tyres. So they're just sitting there. So they're just going to be sitting there. It looks like John Bow shutting down all the systems. I think the Caterpillar Ford is kaput. Let's have a look at that on the replay. Look at the fuel flying out of the refueling. The vent bottle was out. And look how quickly the marshals are in. That was brilliant work. That was great work by the safety crew, the fire crews. They were right on the spot. And that could have been a whole lot worse. Well, we don't often give those guys enough credit. A lot of them are volunteers. They don't do it on a lot of money. But boy, when you need them, they were there instantly. What an outstanding effort now. Here we go for our Be Clear and Simple in-car camera and Jim Richards assisting John Bow. All when it, everything was going so right. This is when it happened. This is the replay. Gosh. And look at the flames at the back there. John Bow wouldn't know anything about it at the moment. Huh? He's, he's there belting up. He was looking down at his lap belts when the fire erupted. Now he's wondering where the hell all this smoke's coming from. That was a very, very dicey situation that was brought under control very quickly, thankfully, for everyone involved. Back to live pictures now. Joining us in the commentary is Shell Helix Ford driver Paul Radisich. Paul, scary moment. Yeah, absolutely. Just shows you how, uh, how fast things can get out of control. Well, tell us uh, about your situation. Things were going so well for you and Steve Ellery. But now you're sitting up here with us for the rest of the day. Well, for us for the moment, and you're, you're out for the rest of the day. Yeah, disappointing. We uh, Everything was going well. We set a pace, and we were just sticking to it. Tyres were terrific. Car was just purring along. Uh, brake pedal was starting to get longer and longer and longer, and then eventually pumped out all the brake fluid. Uh, made a stop. Uh, basically, the guys couldn't find where the problem was. And uh, hence, we've uh, full, fully retired from the event. These guys are going so strong. Garth Tanner has just pa uh, posted the fastest lap of the race, a 1.12.28. They're not slowing up. No, that's, I mean, that's pretty much to the plan, I would think. You know, as the, as the race unfolds, you've got to increase the pace. And uh, obviously, he's, uh, he's in good tune with the car, and he's feeling that the tyres are, are holding up. And, uh, you know, to turn that sort of time is... Uh, He's obviously got a lot of confidence in, in the car and the tyres. Just goes to show, Paul, a lot of people have been talking about the similarity between Winton Motor Raceway, where these guys uh, test, and uh, Queensland Raceway. And they said, you look at the dominant form that Jason Bogwana showed there at the sprint round, and indeed Garth Tander in the earlier VS model here when he won his first round here. They really have these low grip, flat circuits sorted out. Absolutely. I mean, Winton is, is uh, a similar track to this, as in it's, uh, it's, it's very smooth finish and very hard on the tyres. And, uh, uh, you know, their setup obviously works well at Winton, as we've seen, and um, it's working here well today. Currently, Garth Tander has a 26 second lead over Greg Murphy. But keep in mind that they have not fulfilled their brake pad stop as yet, and they are getting very close because it's between lap 48 and lap 112. We are on lap 108. So this car will come in very, very soon to perform a brake pad change, and more than likely you will see Bargwana jump back in the car. Tanda has been so smooth. Look at the car, there's not a mark on it. it looks like at the first lap out, they have done a terrific job. Greg Rust. Well, Jimmy Richards, driving is, uh, is normally hot work, but it's not meant to be that hot. I oh, know, these things happen, they've happened in the past, and they'll probably happen again. It's just a, a problem, and uh, we can do nothing about it. Now, the team have had to go for a bit of a, an old-fashioned move here. We couldn't get the car off the deck, so you've had to uh, pull out the trolley jacks. Yeah, well, I think there's something wrong with one of the jacks where there's no ring gone, and, uh, of course, it won't allow the air to fill the jacks to, to jack it up. That's hard like the car was running well. It was going good, yeah. Yeah, what a tough weekend, tough break. As I say, they talk about these 20 set parts, an air seal in a pneumatic system that can bring your whole car jacks out of uh, commission. And then you're going to have real problems. You can't get the car up in the air, you can't change the tyres. So, just goes to show, you can have the best team, the best preparation in the world, and one little thing like that can let you down. Now, Paul, despite your problem this afternoon, uh, you've got to be slightly optimistic for Bathurst because you and Steve were working very well. The whole thing was looking great. Yeah, we've, we've had a good setup for, for this uh, event, sure, and uh, Steve Allery has driven extremely well all weekend. Here comes Cameron McConville into pit lane in the Mobile One Commodore. He's been struggling for pace. Looks like the Caterpillar Ford getting back into the race after they did that NASCAR-style wheel change with the old manual jacks. 
So they're getting back into it. Look at the Perkins team here getting ready as well. Yep. So uh, Larry about to bring in the Castrol Perkins VT Commodore. There is John Bow back in the car, back out on the car, back out on the track rather, after that very frightening moment. And it's all about to happen. Tander has just gone through on 110 and is in. This is Garth Tander. Greg? Well, when he came in, Lee, I can tell you a bit of a nervous moment for the Ford Tickford Racing Boys. He ran over the uh, the brake pads that they had standing by for their pit stop and the air hose, so we'll have to keep a close eye on that one. Garth is out of the car. Jason Varguana in it, complete with that, uh, that special insert we told you about earlier in the program. Back tyres on. They're going to change the front brake pads here at the moment. We've been running 26 seconds. So a fairly slick stop. We've got, looks like a slight problem there. There's a problem with the front right. We can't get one of the pads out. Well, these guys have been practicing their pit stops back home in Melbourne. And yep. Gary Rogers himself said that, well, yeah, sure, it's fine practicing at home as many times as you like. But when you've got to do it in the heat of the moment, everything changes. Absolutely. With, you know, with the temperatures that are uh, that are in these front hubs and so forth and the, and the disc to the pad, I mean, all sorts of things happen. And that's what we're seeing here. Just a little bit of trouble getting what looked like the left-hand pad out. So Russell Engel jumps aboard the Castrol Commodore, was running third before the pit stop. Race leader was Garth Tander. Jason Bargwana now in the car. This has been a tremendously costly stop, Greg Rust. Well, it's become even more costly because they've gone to try and put the, uh, the front right wheel nut on and they've uh, had a bit of trouble with it. They've had to go to a spare wheel nut. More than a minute lost in the pits. Jason Bargwana wow. drops Ooh. the clutch and gets, gets out of there. But I can tell you, Mark, the actual problem wasn't so much a brake pad. I thought it was a brake pad that was stuck, but taking a closer look at it, it was in fact one of the pistons inside the caliper on the front right. They couldn't actually get the special, I guess, like leverage tool that they use to push the, the pistons back so they can drop the new brake pads in. It wouldn't move for some reason. Yeah, that's always a risk when you leave your pads, pad change to later in the race because those hydraulic pistons which push those pads onto the disc, they get further and further out of the caliper. There's always a risk they can get slightly jammed as they try and squeeze them back to put the new pads in. And that's caught the Valvoline team, unfortunately. Valvoline Cummins absolutely on top here throughout the day, but they just got a minute sitting stationary in the pits, and you allow for the fact they had to slow down and speed up. That's worth more than a lap. Well, that's right. He had a 26-second gap not so long ago, and dumping a minute is not going to help at all. So tough times there. Greg Murphy now leads the race. Well, and wins Kmart Commodore. Baird is second in the Pertec Ford, and they are looking very strong. Neil Bates is running third in the Ford Tickford AU. Russell Ingle fourth. Skippy Parsons in the second car, really run by the Wins team, but it is under challenge recruitment colours. They have recently purchased that car. Unbelievable. And the Pertec Ford is out. Fire underneath the Stone Brothers Racing Falcon. Craig Baird at the wheel. Just saw him come out of turn five. Fire extinguisher at the ready. But that looks terminal, Paul Radisic. Yeah, it, it really does. I mean, as soon as it stopped on the track there, big problem. I'm going to have to leave because uh, it's, it's disappointing to watch all these cars go by the wayside. <laughs> I, mean, I know exactly how they feel. It must be heart-wrenching. You've been there. You know what it feels like from earlier in the day. Yeah, it, it sure does. There's no, no getting over it. Just got to look forward to the next one. And uh, very disappointing for, uh, for the Stone Brothers, I'm sure. Well, you've got to say that this is playing into the hands of Bates and Brabham. They are looking good in second position. We go down to the pits. Well, unfortunately, Jason Bright, uh, tell us what's happened here. Oh, it looks like we just lost an engine. I don't know exactly, you know, what's caused it to go, but, you know, we were sitting absolutely pretty. You know, Craig was doing a fantastic job. Uh, we just put a lap on the Valvoline car. All we had to go was a tyre stop. Um, you know, it's just it's really disappointing. You know, the guys have worked really hard. We've been quickest in every session. We qualified on pole. Um, you know, it's just, it just breaks my heart. You know, that's our championship gone, really, you know, just because so much... So, you know, there's so many points on this race. You know, I just have to kiss this championship goodbye now. I mean, if either of those HRT cars finishes, it's gone. Commiserations, mate. Yeah, thank you. Well, everybody knew this was going to be a hard race, but, well, just this hard, it is unbelievable. There is Craig Baird. It's not his fault. He just happened to be the poor guy behind the wheel when it happened. Here is the Shell Helix replay Oof. of the Pertec Ford launching an engine. Gee, you don't see these engines detonate like that very often these days. That's a big blow-up smoke and oil pouring out of the exhaust pipe. Just a tragic scene for the Pertec Ford. Tremendous operation. They run a great campaign. There's Craig Baird. The Kiwi left stranded out in the middle of the 
the infield. Meanwhile, we've got... This, one is, of the, this is the second car. This is the Bates and Brabham car. Trent Higgs. Yes, there's actually flames on one of the front discs at the moment. We've got Neil Bates staying in the car. They're changing the pads. They've topped up the fuel. But at the moment, it looks like they're having a few problems on the front brakes. Flames as we speak. But it seems to be going OK for the Ford team. But they cannot get this calibre open, as we can see. Well, while we said earlier this is playing into the hands of these guys, how strong are the Wins Kmart team of Greg Murphy and Stephen Richards looking? They have already performed their brake pad change long ago, and they are looking strong. Currently, they have a 38-second lead over these guys who are now in the pit, so that lead is growing by the second. I'll tell you what, if the timing monitor's right, too, these boys are in more trouble because the uh, pad change window was lap 48 to 112, and they've come in on 113. This is 113. Yeah. So I'm not sure if there's been a stuff up there, but they look like they may have gone one lap over if the timing monitor's correct. Paul, that's going to be costly. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. I mean, <laughs> let's just hope the monitors are wrong, but I'm <laughs> sure they're not. But if it's one lap over, they're going to uh, more than likely uh, suffer a penalty for that. Well, wow. mm. well, the wins team have had a frustrating time. Greg Murphy and Stephen Richards have really done it tough in 99. Some success at the Sensational Adelaide 500. We are far from the finish of this race, but those boys are looking smooth at the moment. Murphy leads the way. The Ford Tickford Racing AU. Neil Bates behind the wheel. It finally gets out. This is, of course, the second car. This is the lead car, Greg Murphy. Now, apparently, word through just at the moment that pad change situation with the Ford Tickford car is being discussed in race control as we speak. We're talking about the envelope, the window there when they can come in. They were supposed to come in before lap 112. They came in on lap 113. He had a tyre change and some fuel as we go inside with the face of Russell Ingall. A reminder that Honda Indy 300 comes up Saturday, October 16. The Shell V8, the V8 supercars will be on show again. It won't be a Shell championship round but they will be going flat out in that marvellous street circuit. Of course, this is the second last round of the championship. Double points here and the FAI 1000 Classic in mid-November. Ingle leading, amazing stuff. The two Parsons, Trucky and Skippy, in second place right now. They've already changed their brake pads. Murphy in third, then Barguana creeping back up the order. So is Neil Crompton. Big threat here as well. And the championship leader by 22 points, Craig Lowndes, in sixth place. And looks like he still might be in a very good position. Lee Diffie at the end of the day. Word through from race control at car six and car 35. That is the Brabham and Bates entry and the Ritter and Coleman entry are getting a 60-second stop go for a pad change infringement. Here it is, Neil Bates sitting there. So they did not come in in that 48 to 112 lap window. Oh. They come outside of that and that has cost them a minute. Well, that is a major stuff up in terms of logistics to go one lap over. Goodness me, being held at the end of pit lane for 60 seconds, as you see, a competitive position slipping away. Russell Engel leads the Queensland 500. Parsons in second, here's Greg Murphy in third, some seven seconds behind our race leader. So Parsons is the meat in the sandwich. Now let's pay tribute to some other people who have done very good jobs this afternoon after being back in difficult positions. Neil Crompton in the number five for Tickford Racing AU is up in fifth position now after he and Glenn Seaton being way back. John Faulkner has done a tremendous job. Saw back in all, he is in eighth. Brad Jones after being back in 20th is ninth. And Andrew Medici has been sniffing around that top 10 all day. Now here is the second place car. The two Parsons, two David Parsons. They are both David Jones. John Parsons, and the way we differentiate is between them is David Skippy and David Truckee Parsons. Skippy is the Tasmanian, David Truckee Parsons from Victoria. Skippy Parsons at the wheel now. Very talented Tasmanian. Came onto the scene, was discovered in the early 80s when Peter Jansen took him, took him on board as a relative unknown. As a co-driver for the endurance races, he absolutely stood the touring car world on its ear with his natural speed. He's never lost that. And here pits. he comes into the pits for a critical stop. Well, this makes life easy for Greg Murphy because with those guys out of the way, Murphy will move up into second position quite nicely. And let's not forget about the Valvoline Cummins combination of Jason Barguana and Garth Tander. They're doing very well also. This race is still wide open. It's a driver change as well. So Truckee... 
gets back in. Skippy gets back out. Greg? The Gibson boys having a little trouble with the front right at the moment. It seems to be stuck. They've just gotten it off. Trucky is in. Skippy is out. Now, this should be a fairly slick stop, I would imagine. That was fairly quick with Greg Murphy. No pads to do, obviously. Just tyres, and they're going to top it up with fuel for the run to the flag. Well, this has been an impressive run by these guys. It just goes to show that a lot of the guys that you see down the back of the pack what they can do when they get given some decent equipment. This is yeah. Stephen Richards' car that he's been running all year, Truckee Parsons, and the Challenge Recruitment team have purchased this car, but part of the purchasing deal is that Fred Gibson and his boys will look after it for this race and the FAI 1000, and these guys have been impressive all weekend. Well, I guess this is V8 Supercar fulfilling its original mission statement, which was to allow privateers to compete competitively with professional teams. We saw at Oran Park the full capacity grid covered by less than three seconds. They're constantly picking up the game. Now we're seeing it step into a second phase. We've got guys like David Parsons buying a car from a top team like Gibson Motorsport, getting Gibsons to prepare the car and run it for you. And all of a sudden, as you say, you see these guys who would normally be struggling down the back of the pack, given a chance in the right equipment, they're just as competitive as anyone. Yeah, a great job, a really good job. Trevor Ashby has taken over the wheel from Steve Reed. They are still the top-placed privateers. I'll tell you what, Lee, look as the fast man on the track now. Jason Barguana, he's dipping into some quick times. A 1.12.8 last time from the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. He's only some 23 seconds behind our race leader, Russell Engel. So Barguana really charging. Last lap around, Crompton was quicker than him, though. A 1.12.8.0. So the four Tickford boys cranking it up towards the end as well. They're not out of this also. They are still on the lead lap. But there is quite a gap back from this guy, Russell Engel, the enforcer. He can take it home from here. Lap 122 of 161. Can you imagine if they have a safety car within the next oh. 10 laps or so? It's going to come out here, bunch these guys up bumper to bumper, and you are going to have a sprint, a serious sprint to the flag. And this is what these teams do when they're in preparation for a race like this. While they're out there running on full fuel tanks and checking their tyre durability. They're also looking at the way the car is working when it's on a light fuel load and the tyres are a bit worn because that can be critical in winning a race like this. You get a safety car period, 20, 30, even 10 laps from the finish. You've got to have a setup that's going to work well in that sprint to the flag. We're riding with Neil Crompton inside the number five Ford Tickford Racing AU. This is the factory Ford team. Ford in-car camera. Let's not forget the simple fact that these guys were a lap down. Now, black, five, black flag for 35, that is Ritter and Coleman. Now, obviously, they have not come in for their 60-second stop go. That was for that pad change infringement. Now, maybe uh, Gary Rogers will have something to say about that. We'll wait and see. But we were told from race control earlier that car 6 and car 35 were to come in for a 60 second stop go for that pad change infringement. We did see car six, that was Neil Bates, perform his stop go. We have not yet seen Ritter and Coleman do it. Well, by our calculations, Neil Crompton still has another pit stop to make in car five. So even though he's up there in fourth position, the three cars ahead of him, by our understanding, can now run through to the flag. That's Russell Engel, Greg Murphy and Jason Bargwana, the three Commodores, separated by about 24 seconds over the three. We've got an incredible battle brewing. Craig Lowndes sitting back there in fifth. Todd Kelly, remarkable running car 15 for the Holden Young Lions team. John Faulkner, after all those back problems, earlier in the race, Simon Wills, the current Australian driver's champion, helping him out here. Still up, well up in the top ten. Murphy and Barguana second and third. They don't have to pit. Neil Crompton does. He's in fourth at the moment. Lowndes will inherit fourth place and some more valuable championship points when Crompton eventually goes in and hands over the seat to Glenn Seaton. Mark Noski in sixth. Faulkner, great effort ahead of the Parsons. Both of them. Larkham back in the race after early dramas. And then Trevor Ashby leading privateer. Marvellous stuff, Greg Rust. Well, a quick pit stop that was for Mark Larkham, just 23 seconds. Brad Jones out, Larkham in, some tyres and some fuel for the run to the chequered flag. Now, I've also spoken to Fred Gibson in the last few minutes. They have confirmed that Murphy has enough fuel on board to get to the finish of the race. But also, prior to the start of this race, I found out about a little secret ingredient that Murph and Stevie Richards were using today. Most of these drivers have personal fitness trainers and often uh, are drinking sporting-style drinks like Gatorade in their drinking systems or bottles inside the car. Not these two, they're drinking black Coca-Cola and water. Hang on a sec, Greg. We've seen Mark Larkham go right off the circuit, almost as though he had no steering or a flat front tyre that has affected the front 
splitter and the front spoiler, okay. and he's going to have to come straight back into the pits. Doesn't look good. We just saw the Fertec Ford in such tragic circumstances blow an engine and go out of this race. Jason Bright joins us. What do you think's happened there, Jason? Yeah, the turn one and two, you know, as this race goes on, are just getting slippery and slipperier. Uh, there's a lot of marbles out there. Mark's come out of the pits on cold tyres, and, um, you know, I could see that he was just right out of the gas, but, you know, you just can't make the car turn on those marbles. Well, Mark Larkin, damage to the front end. He's half a lap from coming back into the pits. The crew will be rushing frantically to get another front spoiler. Greg? Lee, the word from the pits down here at the moment is that uh, Mark may have broken a front roll bar. I think that is the, uh, the problem at the moment now. He's trying to limp it back to the pits. They're not quite sure what forced him off. What he did say when he radioed in was he had chronic understeer and he couldn't explain why. Well... It's getting tougher and tougher as this race wears on. 128 laps of 161 as he passes the stricken Fertec Ford. Jason Bright, I can't imagine how you feel at the moment. Yeah, you know, we've, um, we've really had a great weekend this weekend. You know, the car has just been running perfectly. The guys have been working really hard. You know, that we, we had a great car. That The car was running fantastic in the race there. Um, Craig was doing a fantastic job. We, we were looking really good. Uh, we, we only had one more stop to go. Uh, we, we were running at the same pace as, as Larry Perkins and Russell Ingle. Uh, you know, we were pretty much on the same strategy as those guys, except we were going to make our stop just a little bit later. This is the Junior Wins Racing car, the combination of Paul Dumbrell and Matthew White. They've pulled up right alongside the Greenfield Mowers car. No indication as what is to happen to that car. New front spoiler will be put on the Mitre 10 Ford and let's hope they can solve that problem for Mark Larkham and he can get back out there. He was in the top 10. This is hurting him big time. He's not in the championship contention whatsoever. You see Brad Jones talking to him there. We'll have a listen. Don't get off line. Make them go around you. Now, stay on line. Stay on line. Don't get off line. Don't get off line. Don't get off line. Don't get off line. Brad Jones there indicating you must stay on line, saying stay on line. Yeah. So they're pretty frustrated, the boys. Because it's becoming a single lane race track out there, Jason Bro. Yeah, you know, early on in the race, you could you could actually afford to go offline a little bit, and uh, and you wouldn't be in much trouble. But uh, as the race went on, you know, if you're probably even less than half a metre offline, it you just start you just get wider and wider, and uh, until you run out of road. Well, Jason, it was almost like Bathurst all over again, wasn't it? You came in early, earlier than everybody else, and things were looking great. Yeah, you know, the, the strategy was, was uh, sort of falling in our favour. We, we were probably going to come in for tyres uh, with about 25, 30 laps to go. It was just we were, we were going to be able to sprint pretty much to the end, uh, whereas Larry would have been out there for 60 laps, or Russell would have been out there for 60 laps on his tyres, uh, and, you know, we would have been able to give him a really good race. So you want you would have given the Ford fans a bit of something to cheer about too. They're hanging out for a Ford win. It hasn't been a good year. I mean, you blokes have been so close on so many occasions and things just haven't gone the Blue Oval's way. Yeah, you know, uh, it is very disappointing. You know, we really want to do crack a win for the for the Blue Oval and, uh, you know, the, I think the Pertec Ford has certainly shown the way there, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, today just wasn't our day. Steve Johnson currently has got the number 17. Shell Helix Falcon up into the 10th position, but he is a lap down. Now, Bargwana, Murphy and Ingle, it is a three-way fight at the moment. These guys can take it all the way home. So too can Lowndes. Crompton is still remaining in fourth position. Tell you what, it shows there's a bit of speed out there too, Lee. Crompton's just done a 1.11.88. Fastest time we've seen around here have been the mid to high 12s. All of a sudden, Crompton pulls out a blinder. And keep in mind, he still has to make another stop. So he's trying to make up as much time as possible on this leading trio. Lane for the yeah. final time. It's a tough, tough task. Well, at this end of the day, here's John Faulkner in the second of the wins cars. The number 46 machine. Now we heard of John's problems uh, with his back. Very sore back. He said it was excruciating pain. He's now out of the car. You can see him there with the open face helmet. Simon Wills, this year's Formula Holden champion, undefeated in 11 of the 13 races. He did a magnificent job. It just makes you wonder whether uh, Jason Bargwana is aware at the moment that Crompton's supposed to make another stop, applying the pressure. Bargwana responding. He's going to take this one right through to the end. We understand he's got enough fuel, fresh tyres on board, and certainly in terms of his lap quota, he's OK. 30 laps remaining. So Crompton.
Upton has a look down the inside. More than a look, he just gets the nose right alongside the Valvoline. Cummins machine sneaks up the inside. <laughs> Bargwana wants to argue. They're going to go side by side down the straight. This is a sprint race. Well, it almost is, isn't it? Just 30 laps, less than 30 laps now to go. Crompton does make that move, which helps him in the overall scheme of things, but he does have to pit again. So, Bargwana, technically, if you like, will still be hanging on to third. The boys are cranking it up, Jason. Yeah, you know, the, the track is uh, quite good online. Uh, there's just more and more rubber going down all the time. And the more rubber that gets down, the easier it is on the tyres. So you probably find that, that, that that's why they're able to step up the pace a little bit more now at the end of the race. Unfortunately for the Queensland-based teams, we don't see anyone in the top nine cars. This is their home test track. Is the situation in the sprint round here. There was expectations that those Queensland-based teams would have a huge advantage and hasn't come off. As Crompton is a man on a mission at the moment. Currently ahead of Jason Barguana. Now back live, and that's your race leader, Russell Ingle. 13 seconds ahead of Greg Murphy. He has just added another second to that. It was 12 on the last lap. It is now 13.1 seconds over Greg Murphy. And then Barguana sitting third, Lowndes is fourth. Skippy Parsons in the challenge recruitment, Commodore fifth, Neil Crompton sixth. Word just through during that update that the Noski Kelly car, the My Car Holden Young Lions entry, has received the black flag. Trevor Ashby in the Microplex PPG Commodore, top place privateer. It is an outstanding effort. I'll tell you the real action here, though, is this battle for second position. Jason Barguana is right on the back of Greg Murphy. It's under a second, 0.9 of a second that last time around. Barguan has been digging very deep, 12.4 the last time around. There he is, coming up in the back of Greg Murphy. Murphy adjusts his rearview mirror to get a good view of this Valvoline Cummins car coming at him at a million miles an hour. Barguana slowed by that trouble with the pad change. There he is, the battle for second place in the Queensland 500. He was with us not that long ago up here in commentary and he was very excited about his first dip and tan. It was extremely smooth. They got held up ever so slightly in the pits that cost them and now he's working his way back, looking good for second. Currently, Barguana sits ninth in the championship behind Greg Murphy, which is ironic because he's behind him on the track. Well, he was 1.4 seconds faster than Greg Murphy on that previous lap. 1.4 seconds. So Barguana really digging deep. He's got Murphy in his sights, in the gun sights. There's the wins, Commodore. Looks like he might have been held up that time around. We'll check as they come across this time. Well, Half a second. All the raps that go to all the big names about what they do with their cars and how they build them. That is the latest car to come out of the Gary Rogers team, built up from scratch, and it is running second in the race. It is all oh, third at the moment, just about to challenge for second. We thank Jason Bright. Jason, hopefully things go a lot better for you at the FAI 1000. We look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, so do I. I know today was just very disappointing, but we will get back up that mountain and try and get some of these points back. Jason Bright, Pertec Ford driver, exiting the uh, commentary booth and, of course, has already exited the race. Craig Baird was at the wheel when the Pertec Ford blew an engine. It was a very sorry sight. Not like this. This is Craig Lowndes going ever so strong. A 22-point margin coming into this race. Of course, this does count towards the Shell Championship Series, and he will increase that even more. This is Skippy, part, rather, Chucky Parsons is behind the wheel now and is running in fifth position at the moment. Doing a, tr a great job in the challenge recruitment car. This car has been faultless this weekend. Jason Barguana. Yeah. yeah, you take your eyes off them for a second. He's got past Greg Murphy. Jason Barguana moves into second place in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. He's just on another lap, 1.4 seconds faster than the wins machine. So Murphy looks like he's trying to limp at home, whereas Barguana is on a charge. He's now 15 seconds behind our race leader, Russell Engel, in the Castro Commodore. That's the thing to point out, because while it was at 12 seconds and it was at 13, Engel has now pulled out a 15-second gap while these two guys were scrapping. Joining us in commentary now is Larry Perkins. Larry, can your boy do it? 
Well, uh, yeah, the machinery has got to hang in, but he's driving it nice and accurately and uh, still quite a few laps to go, so we're not uh, you know, making any predictions. He's just got to keep it running nice and strong, which it is. You've uh, sort of stepped back a little bit this weekend. You've allowed Russell to do the majority of the work, but your sit yourself was faultless. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether I'll step back at all. Uh, it's just that uh, I let Russell start, and uh, that's the only thing that's changed. No big deal. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's doing a real good job, and I'm happy with my stint. Um, you know, the cars, we just got to keep the car running strong and nice and uh, balanced on the tyres. Your boys in the pits were lightning fast. They were very good. Yeah, the, uh, the pit stops are always crucial here, and you've got to, you know, time them right. And we, we've got all that executed pretty well, uh, I'm obviously pleased about. A lot of people talk about the similarities to Winton Motor Raceway, where you test, Larry, in this place. The similarity is quite strong. Well, uh, in some cases, it's a, the, the sort of the bitumen, if you like, is similar. It's nice and smooth. And, uh, you know, uh, but after that, yeah, it doesn't really make much difference because we don't do any testing anyway. <laughs> That's right. You do all your winning in the workshop. 142 of 161. Well, Larry, you'll be interested to hear this. Apparently, Gary Rogers is on his way to race control to talk about an irregularity when you did your last stop. Well, I wish him luck. Um, I don't know what he's on about <laughs> there, but uh, I know my bloke's out on the track having a race. I'm not going to go up and start arguing with a rule book of man. Well, and a great race it is, and Barguana hasn't been able to pull anything out of... Uh, Russell Ingle in terms of time because the gap was 15 seconds. We'll wait until Barguana comes across the line this time round for the last lap or so. He hasn't been able to do anything about that. Barguana should be across the line by now. We're waiting to, for it to trip up on our timing monitor. Well, he has. He's brought it back under 15, 14, 9. Not by much, but there is still plenty of time remaining. I'll tell you what, if they finish as they are now, Lounge will be on 1,630 points. Engel on 1,588, a 42-point margin as they head into the FAI 1000 at Mount Panorama in November. It's an absolute cliffhanger. Couldn't ask it to be closer than that. And it's brilliant stuff. Crompton, the Ford in-car camera. This is the number five Ford Tickford Racing AU, currently running sixth behind Skibby Parsons and ahead of the Noski Kelly combination. Steve Johnson has worked the number 17. Shell Ford up into eighth ahead of Trevor Ashby. And Simon Wills in the second of the wins racing cars is in the top 10. How have you found it out there, Larry? The conditions, the uh, the slower drivers, just everything. What sort of a race has it been for you? Yeah, the traffic is, uh, you know, the shortness of the track. You keep catching people all the time. Uh, that, that's uh, not a pleasant side of it. And uh, it's not as hard as, uh, hard as work as I thought it would be. Uh, not like the Adelaide race where you're constantly doing gear changes. He's not so hard on the driver and uh, from that point of view it's alright but um, you know, uh, I am looking forward to Bathurst that's the one where we can stretch our legs and get on with it Everyone seemed to be almost intimidated by the tyre situation and, and just a little scared that they were going to go off and they wouldn't be left with any tyres. How, how do you see that now at the other end of the race? Well, uh, we haven't had any of the tyre problems that uh, some, some, you know, if you like, were predicting. And, uh, uh, you yeah, know, that's uh, yeah, this control tyre is such a durable tyre and it's designed to work on all, all tracks. And this is one of the worst ones it could possibly be asked to work on. And it's, you know, initial problems in practice, but gee, it's working good now. Nice overtaking manoeuvre there. The my car entry slipping up the inside of Neil Bates. Greg. Well, Lee, they completed their last stop around about four or five laps ago, but one lap later, poor old uh, Mark Noski had to come back into pit lane again, and this is the reason why. The officials here at the circuit said the car was leaking fuel. This is part of an O-ring. This is part of an O-ring that has come out of the filler side of the fuel tank. Now, because it jammed in there on the way out, the car was leaking fuel out of the actual fillet, down the side of the car and under the track. And unfortunately for, uh, for poor old Noski, he got called back in one lap later to get that out. Can you believe it? They were in for all of 15 seconds to remove it, and he was back out on the track again. They've lost a lot of time as a direct, the direct result of it. But what, what about this for a story, one of those things? A 15-cent motor racing part, if that, putting pay to their day almost. One of those small, insignificant things that uh, are really so costly. It's a very interesting looking top 10. Ingle, Barguana, Murphy, Lowndes, Parsons, Crompton, Noski, Steve Johnson, Trevor Ashby and Simon Wills. As we wind down, you can see the pictures on your screen. A little bit of cloud cover here. As the day grows old, conditions much cooler and the pace is certainly well, it's lifted and now it's eased a little bit. Here's Dick Johnson in the number 17. 
be uh, a bit of an emotional moment for you too, Larry, isn't it? Like Dick Johnson, wonderful competitor. His last, his 200th Shell Series start and his last Shell Series round in front of the Queensland crowd. It's probably be sad to see him go for you. 11 laps to go for the man who might well be within 42 points of Shell Championship leader Craig Lowndes at the end of the day. And what a great battle it would be then in the FAI 1000 Classic. At the end of the season, double points on offer again. And, of course, the prestige of being the winner at Mount Panorama. Greg Rust. Well, we've actually got a bit of a, an interesting scenario down here in pit lane at the moment. I'm with Gary Rogers. Now, Gary, your second car, car 35 of Coleman. Now, tell us it came in for a 60-second stop before, but the way you're reading the situation, you shouldn't have been penalised the Shades of Adelaide. Uh, well, Greg, that's right. I mean, look, the officials are trying to do their job, but really, I reckon we cover fairly sweet, but I'm getting a bit disenchanted with all this. Well, all right, just, just explain it to us. What's happened? OK, you had to do a pit stop to change pads between lap 48 and lap 112. And we have a book which here shows the laps from lap 1 as you go through the race, all the laps. So we get up here... We get up to here, we're in, lap 111, clearly inside the window, absolutely not negotiable. But because the leader of the race had passed the start finish line, they deemed that we actually did it outside the lap, we actually did it after 112. Um, you know, the, the thing has really got to the stage where you, you really wonder about the rules and some of the other things that take place. It's very disappointing, to be quite honest. An unhappy Gary Rogers. Let's hope they can get that sorted out. We initially thought it was something to do between Larry Perkins, Russell Ingle, and the car running second, the Bargwana Tander entry, but it wasn't. It's with Gary's second car, the Ritter Coleman entry. So that settles things down. We are 10 laps from home. Now, here are the casualties. Smurton and Rose, they were the first to go. And Miller, Ricky Adello, Radisic and Ellery. We spoke to Paul up here earlier. Longhurst and Macro, and Darcy Russell and Grant Johnson. We've had quite a few casualties. Heath and Warren Love, Cameron McLean and Wayne Park, they had a shocker today. Despite running so strong and in the top ten earlier, that front left wheel problem. Thorne and Wanless, that is Bob Thorne, Todd Wanless, they're out. And of course, the big one on lap 111, Wright and Baird, who were looking so strong. An engine letting them down. So there you go. We should let you know also that the Scaife Morris entry has come into the pits. They are currently in 24th position and are on 12 championship points. It's nowhere near as many as Mark Scaife wanted to gather today. The minor 10 lap counter, lap 152 of 161. And the general consensus before this race was that it was not going to go the whole way. People were expecting a lot more safety cars. These guys are really cranking it up towards the end. Russell Engel holding a very comfortable 15.99 second lead. Have a bit, look at this guy in the Microplex PPG car. Trevor Ashby and Steve Reed. It is an outstanding drive by them. They are the top place privateers in ninth outright. Behind Dick Johnson, ahead of Simon Wills in the second wins Kmart racing car. Great job for these guys. Trevor hasn't done that much driving this year. Steve Reed has done the majority of the driving. So a job well done. And a job well done to Wally Storey, who runs this car and the Rodney Forbes car as well. Well, they've been Terrific outstandingly six, uh, consistent all year, haven't they, Lee? Yeah, tr very tr tremendous good. Tremendous effort. Ex-Coke Racing, ex-Wayne Gardner Racing Commodore. And uh, the sister car, the Rodney Forbes machine, took the fight right up to Cameron McLean in the privateers battle. This car was very strong too with the man they call Big Bird, Steve Reed at the wheel. But these two, one of the longest driving combinations in the history of Australian touring car racing. They've been together for a long, long time. Both 47 years of age, both grew up in the same area of Sydney. Both set up a panel beating and smash repair business together. So they spent a lot of their lives together and they race together too. Now look at that new combination in second in the privateers. Leighton Cranbrook and Dean Croswell, the Tasmanian and the Northern Territorian. They're doing exceptionally well. 14th outright and that is uh, Cranbrook's first endurance race. He's doing an outstanding effort. So too Rod Nash and Dean Wanless, the former NASCAR racer. It's his first V8 supercar race in their third outright in the privateers battle.
So that's a great day's racing for those guys. Here is the second wins Kmart car. John Faulkner, Simon Wills. Simon Wills is behind the wheel. You may remember Simon drove for the wins team last year and was involved in that massive accident on top of the mountain in the FAI 1000 Classic. He's had a much smoother run today. Faulkner and the entire team very impressed with the young Kiwi. 22-year-old based in Melbourne. He's done a good job to remain in the top 10. Yep. 22-year-old, originally from New Zealand. He was a sensation in the Australian Drivers' Championship this year, winning 11 from a possible 13 rounds with Malcolm Ramsey's team. It's been tremendous, and he really wants to get a position, significant position, in V8 Supercar in 2000. Loves the category and would love to get a competitive drive. Sister car coming up. This is Greg Murphy in the number seven machine. Currently running third outright and some 8.9 seconds adrift of Jason Barguana. But some valuable, valuable championship points. And in fact, if Murph stays there, he will pick up 264 points. You got to look at his endurance record now. This looks like oh. the Trimble Heffernan entry again oh, going. Oh dear, oh dear. These guys are having a terrible day. That's number four, isn't it? Yeah, that's four. Severe grip problems in the Daily Planet machine. Also, too, those guys don't do a great deal of driving throughout the year, so it's hard to expect them to jump back in and do a, uh, a polished performance first up. We'll see them at Bathurst as well. Getting back to Murphy and Richards, Murphy in particular did a great job at Sensational Adelaide 500. So too did Stephen Richards. Both drivers will receive 264 championship points if they remain where they are. That certainly puts them in good stead for the FAI 1000. Trent? What a day it's been for the Wins Racing team. Fred Gibson's here with me. We've, we've just heard that the Parsons car's done a 1.12.8, one of the fastest laps of the day. They're running in fifth. Murphy Richards in third. What a day, Fred. It's been a great day. It's been a good run before we go to the big one. And uh, to get two cars home in the top ten is always a bit of a feat. To be running competitive, but we're pretty sore losers. Like, it would have been nice to win it. But Greg, you know, we're giving our best shot with Greg today. And the thing is, no, we look forward to Bathurst. There's been some big-name casualties out there, but you guys have just held it together. Yeah, it's very difficult running two-car team and getting two cars up there the day we've done a good job it's on a young team we said before we started this year it would take us a while to get our act into gear we have and the cars finished strong today and what about greg and steven what a combination especially greg on the most recent laps he's just really lifted hasn't he yeah i think greg and steve like i think they're as good as anyone there if they don't put scafie and lounsey together and they're going to if they're going to separate them about us they're all pretty even they put those two together they're probably the pick of the bunch but hopefully they'll separate them if they do separate them, they're going to bring them down to our level and we'll give them a shake for their money Best of luck. Well done. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, word just through. Unbelievably, we may have a safety car incident on the circuit at the moment in turn one. Look at that. That is the John Deere VT of Mark Poole and Tony Scott. A safety car period. 156 of 161. Whether they will let this run to the end or not, we will have to wait and see. And that is Tony Scott climbing the wall. No idea of what has happened there, but he has gone the full length of that sand trap and more. And is on the other side of the wall now. We will wait and see if the safety car comes out. Well, we could have a very dramatic end to the Queensland 500. Russell Ingle currently holds an 18 second lead from Barguana and Murphy in third. We've got a Shell Helix replay coming up of what exactly happened with the John Deere Commodore. Well, they're probably so close to the finish of the race and considering he's right over the other side of that gravel trap. Well, yeah. He might be considered in a safe position. There's the Shell Helix replay. Following in the tracks of John Trimble much earlier in the race, he's got everything locked up. And it just keeps ploughing on. But he's so far off the uh, hit list there, they might just leave him there with the remaining laps. Well, that would be that would be almost cruel to Russell Ingle after he has done so much work with just five laps to go. And he has now pulled it out to 19.6 seconds, the Enforcer. He is unstoppable. Oh, look at his last lap time, a 1.12.99. He's been so consistent, consistently fast. Bargwana was pushing so hard there to try and close the gap. But all Ingle's done is respond and pump it out. It started out at 12, 13 seconds. He's built it up, built it up, built it up. 19.6 seconds. Big puff of smoke from the back wheel of the Castrol Commodore as he came across the start finish line. Let's not forget, they won the Tickford 500 at Sandown last year, and it was superior tactical decision-making that got them there in the wet. 
It's been a totally dry race today, that's obvious. But again, they shine through in the Enduros. It hasn't been the easiest year for Russell, but he has managed to scrape and gather points through all the time, so much so that he sits third in the Shell Championship Series. The man who is ahead of him, Mark Scape in second, has had a disastrous day. Russell will leapfrog him and close right up on Craig Lowndes if positions remain as is. Lowndes is back in fourth behind Murphy and Barguana. Parsons is fifth. Crompton is sixth. Noski is seventh. Johnson is eighth. Ashby is ninth. And Wills is tenth. Yeah, I think a testament to this team's strength and enduro trim was the FAI 1000 last year where they had to compete with uncompetitive tyres. Oh, there's car 15 in trouble out in the middle. So close yet so far for the young Lions. Let's go to Greg Rust. Well, plenty of nerves down here in pit lane at the moment. The person that's chewing the fingernails the most, Julia Ringle, you're watching with anticipation. Yes, I'm a little bit nervous. I'll be glad when it's over, I have to tell you. It's been a long day. He's driving quite well at the moment. It seems as though you're riding absolutely every lap with him, though. I am. I'm sure Larry is, too. I'm sure he's worse than what I am. All right, well, hopefully we'll have a happy chat with you at the end of the race. Thanks very much. Crompton has done a remarkable job toward the end of the day. On board. And he is following the sister car as they squeeze through on the inside of the K&J Radiators AU. That is the combination of Greg Crick and Paul Wheel. Almost home here at Queensland Raceway. It is one lap to go. Not even that for Russell Ingall. And he has remained so calm. We had Larry Perkins up here earlier. He explained that he did what he had to do and Russell has done a brilliant job. The boys in the pits. Barry Abbott-Meyer, Oscar Furinotto. Whoa, that is Murphy, he's gone! No, Greg Murphy right at the end of the race is off in the sand trap. And he's trying to get keep going and work his way around the outside. I'm trying to, we're trying to figure out exactly where that is. Right at the other end of the circuit, just before the last corner onto the main straight. That is right in the middle. So Murphy bringing the wins Commodore back onto the circuit. That is disastrous for Murph. On the final lap, that will bring Lowndes surely up into third position. But it is all about the win. The Castrol Perkins Commodore of Russell Ingall and Larry Perkins. It has been the first race, the inaugural Queensland 500 at Queensland Raceway. And what a race it has been for Russell Ingall. The enforcer brings it home. There's Larry waving the cap. And he says, you beauty, this championship is far from over. What a drive. Russell Ingall, incredible stuff. Greg Rust is down in pit lane. Larry Perkins is there. Greg, can you grab onto Larry? We certainly have, Lee. Very happy scenes down here. Larry, you've got a smile wider than... Uh, I can't imagine how happy you are right now. Yeah, you're not wrong. This is, uh, this is uh, one of the ones that counts. Uh, one down, one more to go. What, uh, what was your attack today? I mean, uh, this whole thing everyone talked about being strategy, you obviously had it right. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. It's been running out of coffee. But uh, the bottom line is you've still got to prepare it well, and uh, yeah, that's the secret. And that uh, we have a good team of guys. They did all that. Then all Russell and I have to do is drive it. You and the team have done very well. Congratulations. Three hours, 29 minutes and 44 seconds. The duration of the race. And there is third place, unexpectedly the expense of the wins team well that is heartbreaking stuff for Greg Murphy and Stephen Richards right at the death Murphy ran off well amazing stuff Bargwana did get there for second in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore but that is a man he is the man at the moment Russell Engel there is the Holden Young Lions car being attended to Mark Noski and Dick Johnson his 200th Shell Championship Series drive and his final drive in Brisbane. He farewells his loyal Queensland fans. An enjoyable day. It's been probably tougher than he thought, but still a good effort. He finished seventh, and there is Greg Murphy. He has come across the line in sixth position. That is tough stuff for Murph. And there is Stephen Richards running down toward him. 
He'll be saying, never mind. And uh, a great drive by both of those guys. But Russell is pumped. He is ready to party, and he does party. I heard him the other day on a radio interview, and he said, if I win, he said, I'll drink the bar dry. Well, get ready, Brisbane, because the enforcer will be partying tonight. That's for sure. 300 Shell Championship Series points going to Russell Ingle and Larry Perkins. There is Oscar Furinato, his main man. Those two guys work so hard all year, and that's what they work hard for, for double points. There's Larry as the two embrace, and this championship is far from over. How about it? When it counts, the Enduros, these two guys are amazing. Their track record speaks for itself. And the enforcer has brought it home. He qualified the car. He started the car. Larry, the chief, did the middle stint. And Russell brought it home. Over behind those guys in the Valvoline camp, there's plenty of happy faces there as well because that was an excellent job by Barguana and Tanda. And their team, despite having some troubles in the pits, brought it home for second. But Perkins and Ingle, the Castrol team, Stand tall at Queensland Raceway. Amazing stuff. Russell did very well here in the sprint round early on. And now he wins the inaugural Queensland 500. And as casual as you like, he and Larry just having a little bit of a chat as we have a look at your Shell Helix race score. Perkins and Ingle take it out. 23 seconds behind is Tander and Barguana. Lowndes and McConville. Well, Lowndes would have said thank you very much and he wouldn't have liked that at the expense of his mate, but he will take the points. He and McConville finished in third from Seaton and Crompton. That was a great effort for those guys to come back onto the lead lap. Parsons and Parsons, that is an outstanding effort from those two guys, Truckee and Skippy. Richards and Murphy, they really should have been in the top three. That is hard luck for those guys. Johnson and Johnson, Dick and Stephen finish in seventh. And top privateer, Ashby and Reed. Well done to Trevor and Steve, an outstanding drive. Faulkner and Wills in the second wins car will finish ninth ahead of Brabham and Bates in the second of the FTR cars. Dougal McDougal, how about that? The former Formula Ford driver and Andrew Medici finishing in 11th. Coleman and Ritter, the rookies in the second Valvoline car in 12th from Leighton Cranbrook and Dean Croswell. They will be ecstatic with that. Wheel and Crick, that's also a very solid result. And another rookie, Dean Wamless with Rod Nash in the Auto Pro Commodore in the top 15. That is outstanding. Larkham and Jones in 16. Back we go to Tratt and Jones in 17th. Considering they started in 32nd, that is a good drive too. Bow and Richards, they had their problems. So too did Dillman and Cotter. Melinda Price and Dean Lindstrom in the Ultratune car, finishing in 20th position. Conway Shaw, Scaife back in 22nd in the points. But that only yields him 36 points. That is tough stuff. A hard day for Mark Scaife and Paul Morris. Emma Zedes and Wilmington rounding out the 24, just ahead of Osborne and Peters. Wakefield and Canto. We go back. Kelly and Noski. That last uh, couple of laps were costly. 27th there for them. Dropping time, and, uh, well, it was tough for those guys too. Rodney Forbes, we saw him spin earlier. And Paul Romano and Thomas Mazira, despite being very strong early on, finishing in 30th position. And we go back through the casualties. All of those guys out. And some very big names there. Back to the early retirements. Marvellous performance. We said from the start it was a battle of tactics. It was a battle of daring driving and strategic importance and they did it very very well and those two guys Perkins and Ingle are arguably the best in the business at these endurance races of course Bathurst winners the year before last and Jason Bright and Craig Baird were in such a good position that they were out of the race early and finished up with no points for the day. Mark Scaife will get something out of this race in terms of the championship, but he's still a long way behind Craig Lance, who I figure is 54 points in front of Russell Ingle, the race winner in the championship, going into the final round, the FAI 1000 Classic. And with double points again on offer in that particular race, that is not a big lead. It'll be fantastic stuff. 300 points for the win, just repeating that. So 54 is about a sixth of that. So it'll be incredible stuff once again. Greg Murphy, I mean, that has uh, actually been a boost to Craig Lowndes. He gained points from Murph's spin with just over a lap to go on the race. And uh, Lee Diffie now joins me. 
What a costly thing, not only for Murph, uh, not, not just in terms of the championship, he was a long shot for that, but in terms of the race and also uh, for Russell Ingle, really, it cost him points too overall when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing way to go out. Actually, I was just speaking with, uh, with Greg and he was saying it actually popped a piston out of the calipers, so, and he said he just put his foot to the floor, so just ran straight off the circuit, which is a really hard way to end the day after a very good drive by both he and Stephen Richards. We'll go through the points in more detail later, of course. The presentation is still to come, so please stay with us for that. I'm sure Russell Ingle and Larry Perkins will have plenty to say on the podium. Right now, here's Mark Osler. Well, they said the Queensland 500 was going to be a thriller, a great battle of tactics and driver precision. Well, it certainly proved that. Everyone guessing right up to the end when Russell Engel and Larry Perkins brought it home for Holden. In third position outright today, though, we must put our hands together. Very lucky Greg Murphy will be kicking himself at the moment. But third place after 500 kilometres of gruelling competition, the mobile Holden Racing Team Commodore of Craig Rounds and Cameron McConville. <laughs> Go the Holdens was the cry. Uh, gee, what a good what a good time to jump aboard the Mobile Holden Racing Team. Yeah, it is, Mark. But I tell you what, I was very very lucky out there. My tyres went away probably 10, 15 laps from the end of the stint. So uh, we sort of kept it on the road on the black stuff and handed over to the lad here, and uh, he brought it home. Was it hard out there? Very very hard. I think everyone uh, was probably driving, you know, in, with a little bit in reserve for at least 30 laps of the stint because it was really difficult to get the full uh, full stint out. But uh, thanks to everyone in the HRT team, they did a great job today. I certainly did, Cameron McConville. Let's call Craig Lowndes in here. Craig Lowndes, can you get your hand free? <laughs> Plenty of support up here from the Queenslanders, and of course that result uh, keeps you very much high up in this championship battle, going right down to the wire at Mount Panorama. Well, we thought it would. Uh, I guess we were very lucky towards the end there. Murph uh, had some problems, not sure exactly what, but we got relegated to third and uh, very happy with that. But uh, to Mobile, Holden and Bridgestone did a fantastic job. All the guys, obviously this is what we wanted to do to carry it on to Bathurst, and uh, so far so good. It was a pretty, pretty difficult start to the weekend for you, by the way. You were playing around with the setups and everything, but it looks like you got the car working brilliantly for race day. Well, yeah, Cameron and I obviously uh, you know, sort of try to uh, conserve, conserve virtually at the start there, so we had a bit of reserve at the end, but uh, you know, uh, Russell, Larry and Garth and uh, Bargs here just uh, did obviously uh, did a better job than us on the day. And uh, I guess look at that point situation. You and Ingle now very close. Bathurst is going to be an absolute thriller. <laughs> Well, it will be. It's obviously, uh, it was designed like this, the series, and uh, it, is going, it is going to go down to Bathurst, and uh, really, hopefully, we can have a good week up there like we had this weekend. Congratulations, Craig Lowndes. Put your hands together, folks. Third place in the Queensland 500, and it's going to make a great race at Mount Panorama in November. Second place today, well, we saw them fight all throughout the day. Tremendous rise from two young talents. Put your hands together for Garth Tender and Jason Bargwana. Come over here, champion. Hey, baby. Gee. Yeah, yeah, baby. You're going to be famous for that. They call you Elway Jetson or uh, Austin Powers. I don't know. You've got plenty of uh, nicknames, but what a fantastic drive. It's a bit scary. This trophy's bigger than me. <laughs> oh, what a day. I mean, it was just fantastic. Garth did a great job yesterday putting the car in the front row, and it made it really easy. I mean, the team worked tirelessly all week. I mean, uh, the car was just fantastic. And towards the end there, it was just pulling off 12 twos all day, so I was having a ball. Well, you were doing some great times at the end there, but Russell was just keeping you, he was actually building the gap toward the end. Were your tyres going off or was the car good? Yeah, I was coming down the back straight there looking across and I could see his headlights and I'm thinking, I'm catching him, I'm catching him. But uh, in the end, the tyres sort of went away a bit and uh, I just backed it off and finished for second. How would you cope with the massive height difference between you and your co-driver? Were the pit stops OK? Yeah, that no, went well. Actually, it was, uh, there were quick stops and it all come together nicely and the whole plan worked together. So, hey, credit to the guys. Congratulations, Jason Bargwine on the team. Let's get Garth in here quickly. Gee, you're really on an upward spiral and you, you must like this place. You won your, your first Shell Championship round here early in the year in the old VS. Now you've come back for another podium position in the VT. Yeah, it's not a bad place, is it? <laughs> but um, no, nah, it's credit to the guys and to Jason. He just drove flat out all day, and um, the guys gave us a car that we could do uh, consistent 12s all day. Uh, we had a bit of a problem with one of the stops, but uh, <laughs> we reckon by the time Bathurst comes around, we'll have that sorted. So um, yeah, we're pretty happy. Thanks to Valvoline Cummins and Holden, and uh, see you next time. That must have uh, taken a lot of lot of control, a lot of controlled aggression to drive the car out there. Because if you push too hard, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? Well, that's right. I mean, I, in my stint, I went out with a set plan, and then. Um, we had a pace car and after that I thought oh, I'll press on a little bit harder and the car was even better again so uh, we probably should have gone that faster pace through the whole stint but now we know that now and uh, you just had to look after the tyre and uh, wait for the time to go. What odds are Tanda Bargwana win at Mount Panorama? 
good. Oh, we'll wait and see, but uh, <laughs> a little fella here reckons it's not bad, so we'll see how we go. A little fella here. Put your hands together for the little fella and the big fella. James Bargwana and Garth Tander. Brilliant second place. But as always, the major spoils belong to the winners, and as they do so often in endurance car racing, these guys are at the top of the tree. I'm talking about Larry Perkins and Russell Engel. We've got some software and some uh, reeds there for you. There you go. You like wearing those things, don't you, Larry? Congratulations, boy. I mean, you have had one of the worst sprint series ever, and when, it, when, it, when we talk about endurance racing, all of a sudden you change. Well, uh, you know, this is the one, one of the ones that count for sure, and uh, I make no secret of it. I mean, I try to win the short races, but it doesn't happen, and uh, I try to win the long ones, and, and we have more success. And uh, it's all about a team, though, and uh, Russell and I had the easy job. We just had to drive it. It was a very good car, and uh, obviously I thank my sponsors, Castrol and Holden. They've been right behind me for a long time now, and uh, I'm delighted to have, uh, you know, given, uh, come home with the... Uh, what do you call it, the gravy or whatever, you know? <laughs> the software, so the trophy wear, I should say. Um, tell me, was this as tough as you expected? A lot of people were saying this was going to be a real endurance test, one of the toughest on drivers and cars. Did it work out that way? Well, no, it wasn't as tough as the Adelaide race. It was well, not as hard as I thought. And uh, I did have the long middle stint, which Russell uh, gave me. And uh, thank you, Russell. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, we, we, had a, we had a change around. I, I, uh, Russell started, uh, as you know, and uh, I was very happy with that. I, you know, I thought, well, I'll give him the car at the finish when the track uh, arguably could be better. And we want, you know, if you have to press on for a win, uh, you know, he's been doing a better job than me this year. And so uh, anyway, he didn't have to press on and it all worked out. And uh, very happy about all that. I bet he is. Congratulations. Let's get Russell Engel here, the enforcer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you certainly did some enforcing today. That was uh, a brilliant drive, particularly at the end there when you're under maximum pressure from Barks. Mate, I just love Queensland. How good's this place? I've had some great races up here, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, Lansley reckons when you're moving up here, I'm, I'm gonna have to get a place up here soon because it's just, <laughs> just absolutely unbelievable. And as Larry said, thanks very much to the team, our sponsors, Castrol, and obviously fantastic Holden. Um, look, it's just been a great day, but. Endurance races are about teams, and uh, the team caught all the right shots and made my job just a hell of a lot easier. How tough was the competition out there? It looked incredible. Well, you know, in that last stint, I sort of um, I had, we had I think about 11 seconds on Murphy, and we were, I was just holding the gap. But um, you know, the, the thing about it, you just never knew whether the tyre was going to go off or not. But the the, the British shows hung in there great, so you know, it was no real dramas at all, and we just kept trucking on. Had a little bit in reserve just in case, but uh, it's those last few laps. I'll tell you what, it's, it's still hard work. And finally, it looks like the FAA 1000 at Bathurst on November 14 is coming down to a real fight between you and Lansley. That's going to be one hell of a day. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting race, actually. And, uh, well, we're looking forward to it. And, look, Larry's just the king of building endurance cars, and we're just really looking forward to it. And, and the boss here really burns up there, so <laughs> we can't wait to get there. Well, there you are, folks. Put your hands together. The winners of the inaugural Queensland 500, Larry Perkins and Russell Engel. I was still in the end. Well, for the record, Greg Murphy, a victim of circumstance in that tragic entry to what would have been uh, his last lap in the race. As the guys celebrate Murph, I don't know what's going through your mind, but it won't be pretty. No, it's not, mate. I'm um, pretty disappointed with the way it all finished, but we had a piston uh, pop out on the brake caliper, and uh, that was the end of that. Pedal went to the floor, and I thought, well, I'd better not go straight, so I'll try and throw it sideways. And it, luckily it stopped and we got to the finish, but obviously pretty disappointed not to be on the podium. You covered so much territory in going off that, uh, in fact, in a sense, you were lucky to get back on and still pick up, I think, sixth place. Yeah, we uh, just kept off the off the barrier and, and got out of the sand, luckily, and just kept it moving enough that it didn't get stuck. So pretty fortunate, I suppose, to cross the line. So, to, drag a, uh, to drag a positive out of it, you've got to be pleased with the way you and Stephen went, and that's certainly looking good for, for the FAI 1000 because you're both very strong. Yeah, well, I think I think our car is going to work better at, at Bathurst. Um, we, we did struggle a little bit here, but still, it, we're, the car did work really well. We're pleasantly surprised in the race that we could go to our pit stops. Um, had a few dramas with one of the stops, which cost us a bit of time, but, um, you know, we, we finished and it would have, been, would have been really great to finish on the podium for all the guys because the guys and the team have worked really, really hard, so it's disappointing. We got a great shot of you there at one stage for the first pit stop. You look like you're about to start a 100 metre sprint. I wanted to get him out of the car, get out. <laughs> to, you know, you try and get in there. It's all pumped up and the heart rate's going and you just want to get going. Well, uh, let's have a look at uh, some vision here 
Murph, this is the replay of you going off at the end. Yeah, well, it, the, the brake pedal basically just went straight to the floor, and as you can see, I, I, I turned it hard right because I thought oh, there's two guys in front of me, one of them was Bargs. I thought about, you know, going straight, but no, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. So luckily, it went all the way to the fence and um, just stayed just out of the gravel there and got some, got some motion happening. You skillfully backed it in, mate, so you could uh, be pointing in the right direction to find some grass and some traction and get back on the track. That was very well done. You're always thinking, Bill. Always thinking. And honestly, you do. You think about how am I going to get out of this? And, and lucky it didn't hit the fence hard and didn't do much damage, so we got going. But there was, awful, there was an awful lot of bumping going on when we got back on the track. There was no no rubber left on some of those tyres. Also, there there was some firm ground and some grass to the side, so that you could actually drive back around. Yeah, fortunately, um, there was just a little bit there, so it was lucky that we could get right. It took a while to get going, and uh, then that last lap with no brakes at all was quite in entertaining. Obviously, the uh, sensational Adelaide 500 at the start of the year wasn't a true indication because the team sort of wasn't used to you guys working together just at the moment. This is a better indication now. How is everything logistically and the team's fully moulded now after a full season in good stead for the FAI 1000? Yeah, well, we know the car's very reliable. Well, you know, we, we actually, that was sort of our fault, really, what we did. We had a brake problem yesterday, chose to put some different pads in the car for today, and we knew it was going to be close, but and I pushed pretty hard at the end to try and catch Bargs. As you can see, uh, you can see he was coming back towards me, and, uh, mate, you know, we took a bit of a gamble on that. I didn't think the brakes were that bad, but obviously they were. So the car's fantastic. It's really reliable. It runs all day, and I think coming uh, FIA 1000, um, we're going to be looking really good. At one stage, was there any confusion? Because we saw you come in, and it seemed as though the team weren't ready for you did you come in early or yeah there was a radio um, malfunction we um, uh, one the the Parsons car was supposed to come in but uh, the call came to me so I was actually coming down the middle straight and was like in this lap in this lap so I came in but it was actually for the other car so I was about 12 laps early and um, when I did come in the guys weren't ready because they had to obviously swap the tires over put my tires on the car and there was a bit of confusion so we um, I did a double stint ended up doing a double stint whereas Steve was supposed to finish the race well in a nutshell bad luck but well done and we'll say take the positive away from it yeah, will try to. I mean, um, the guys did an awesome job this week and uh, really got to take take the credit for it. And, you know, hopefully Bathurst, will, we will be on the podium. It won't be uh, a last lap disaster. Well, great save, Greg Murphy, and best of luck in the FAI 1000 Classic. Thanks, guys. Really looking forward to it.